Saad Zaglul and the British. When Saad Zaglul went to see Sir Reginald Wingate, the High Commissioner in Egypt, on the 13th of November 1918, to ask to be allowed to go to London and demand independence for Egypt, he was already an old man, with a crowded political past behind him. He had been born, probably in 1857, in Ibania, the son of a local well-to-do family, with some official connections to the province. He had been sent to Cairo to study at Al-Hazar, there became a disciple of Muhammad Abdu, who made him literary editor of the Egyptian Gazette, of which Abdu was editor for a few years. Between the accession of Tawfiq Pasha to the Khedivate and the fiasco of the Urabi Rebellion, while he was literary editor, Zoglul contributed an article to the Gazette on constitutional government, which provides a remarkable indication of the views he then held, and with which both Egyptians and British continued to associate him for many years later. The tyrant, wrote Zaglul, is usually defined as he who does what he pleases irresponsibly, who rules as his passions incline him, whether this agrees with the Shah or is contrary to it, whether it conforms to the Sunnah or differs from it. Because of this, you see that when people hear this vocable or something similar to it, they attribute to it this meaning and are seized with displeasure at its mention, owing to the great misfortunes they have derived from it, and to the great damage it has done to peoples and nations, They are justified in their displeasure and disgust, because they have derived from it nothing but misfortune and from its rule nothing but mishaps. They have indeed seen that tyranny makes souls perish unjustly, and that it eats the possessions of men greedily, sheds blood without due cause, and brings utter destruction on the country. Therefore men are not to be blamed if they are disinclined to praise it, even though some might understand by it something which is not its usual meaning. It is clear from what we have said above that the divine law does not allow it, and that it makes mandatory the limitation of rule by tradition and law, but it is clear and obvious that the rules of the divine law by themselves cannot limit rule, because they are but concepts present in the mind of doctors and learned men, or else, as in, are indicated by means of symbols set down in books, they are not sufficient to control the ruler if he has any knowledge of them, for limitation of rule to be efficient there must be men who actually conduct themselves according to its tenets and who behave as these rules require, men who are not ready to set the right the ruler, he should he deviate from the true path and exhort him to keep to it and walk it in its ways. It is for this reason that our Lord Umar, may God be pleased with him, asked the people in his well-known address to set him right where, whenever he erred in applying the rules of the noble Shah. And for this reason, God, the Most High, said, Let there be formed among you a group who call for good deeds, who prescribe that which is customary to consider good, and who prohibit evil, and these shall prosper. It cannot be denied that this noble verse calls generally on kings and others to do good. It orders them to follow what is customary to consider good, and it forbids them the doing of evil, so that religion may be firmly based. Nothing trespass his prescribed bounds, whether he rules or is ruled. The duty cannot be delegated, but is obligatory and incumbent on all, as the doctors have stated. It was made obligatory on the Muslim community that an Ummah, meaning a Taifa group, drawn from it should arise, whose duty would be to call for good actions, to prescribe that which is customary to consider good and to prohibit evil, in order that the divine law may be safeguarded and in order that those who attempted to transgress should not trespass its limits, and those with wayward passions should not haughtily disregard it. The article, with all its limitations of style and argument, is for its time and place a remarkable attempt to deduce the necessity of constitutional government from the prescription of Islam. Whether the attempt is convincing or not, the fact remains that Zaglul continued to be associated with such views after the Urabi Rebellion, when he became a lawyer with a private practice and subsequently a judge in the civil courts. It was on the strength of these views of his association with the disciples of Muhammad Abdu and of his reputation for uprightness and honesty that Cromer chose him in 1906 to become Minister of Education. Cromer had a high regard for Muhammad Abdu and considered that his disciples, whom he called the Girondists of the Egyptian National Movement, were the only group with whom lay any hope of constitutional advance in Egypt. Zaglul was also known to be opposed to Mustafa Kamil, whom he described as mad. His advancement was thus a deliberate move to checkmate the Khedive Abbas Himil by encouraging those to whom he was opposed. It was well known at the time that the Khedive hated Muhammad Abdu, who had died in 1905, 
It is reported, for instance, that when he heard that some of his court officials had attended Muhammad Abdu's funeral, he became very angry and said, he is, as you know, the enemy of God, the enemy of the prophet, the enemy of religion, the enemy of the prince, the enemy of the ulama, the enemy of the Muslims, the enemy of the people, the enemy even of himself. Why then show him such regard? The Khadiv did not like Zaghul's appointment and subsequently came into conflict with him over the separate institution of a school of religious law, which would not be under the control of Al-Azhar, a project which Zaghul advocated and the Khadiv opposed. He liked him even less when he suspected that Zaghul, together with his brother Fafi, were instrumental in organising his al Uma, the People's Party, a party which stood for constitutionalism and opposed the Khadiv's autocratic leanings. Zaglul continued a minister for a number of years and went out of office in 1912. While in office and also out of it, he showed in public the same moderation which for Cromer was the hallmark of the Hamid Abdu's followers. Thus, in 1909, he was one of those who defended against nationalist clamour the extension of the, of the Suez Canal concession, and when he stood for membership of the Legislative Assembly in 1913, his address to the electors of the Cairo constituency, where he was the candidate, confided itself to four points. He promised that, if elected, he would press for judicial reform, for educational reform, for municipal reform in Cairo, and that he would try to see that more attention was given to the needs of agriculture. This was by and large the public reputation of the man who in November 1918 went with Abdel Aziz Fahmy and Ali Sharawi, both connected with the People's Party pre-war days, to see Sir Reginald Wingate to demand Egyptian independence. It is true that by then he was generally identified as a leader of the opposition. His activities in the two years preceding the war had caused the residency to include him in its bad books. When he had resigned as Minister of Justice in March 1912, it was owing to a clash with the Khedive. He is, wrote Kitchener to Great, recounting the events which led to Zaglul's resignation. A very trying person to work with, owing to a complete want of tact, and he does not get on well with his colleagues or the Khedive. Ever since his appointment, Saad Pasha has been on more or less bad terms with His Highness. Zaglul, it seems, has offered to resign the previous May, but the differences were then patched up. Kitchener had tried to compose their quarrels. I must say, however, that Saad Pasha's character is very difficult, if not impossible. Zaglul, claiming to base his conduct on honest conviction, had continued to apply pinpricks to the Khedive. To start with, Kitchener had tended to be in his favour, but the incident which now led to Zaglul's resignation made him change his mind. It seems that he accused of corruption Hussein Muharram Pasha, who had recently been appointed by the Khedive as the trustee of a Wakaf. These charges he could not substantiate, and I could not help thinking, Kitchener wrote, that the fact that Hussein Pasha had replaced Saad Pasha's brother-in-law in the post of Under Secretary of War had a good deal to do with the latter's attitude. The Khedive took grave offence at Zaglul's accusation, holding it to be an attempt to besmirch his reputation in Kitchener's eyes, and said he would make no further part in the administration if Saad remained a minister. Zaglul had then to resign. Zaglul's later career is any guide. His querulous parade of principle may have stemmed from jealousy and disappointed ambition. Since he may have held that on Boutrous's Ghali's assassination in 1910, it was he rather than Mohammed Sayyid who would have been appointed chief minister. His subsequent activities quickly showed that he was a man quick to invoke his honest conviction, but quite flexible in changing it as the circumstance required. When he went out of office, he seems to have coquetted with the Nationalist Party, whose late leader he had called mad. This party, which was then opposed to the Khedive Abbas, promised to support him in the forthcoming elections for the Legislative Assembly. The Nationalists, as one of them wrote to their exiled leader, Muhammad Farid, believed that they had bound to their cause heart and soul, Caliban wa Caliban. Zaglul, however, soon abandoned them for a more profitable connection. In a memorandum of June 1914, Sir Ronald Graham, advisor to the Ministry of the Interior, wrote that during these elections, Zaglul was in constant communication with the palace and a powerful press campaign was mounted in his favour. When the assembly met, he succeeded with the active help of the palace in becoming the elected vice president and became, as Graham put it, the embodiment of the spirit of mistrust and hostility to the government then being energetically promoted by the Khedive. The Khedive's purpose then was to have his own way in regard to the sale of the Myriot Railway, by which he stood to make a great deal of money. Kitchener was adamantly opposed to what he considered to be a piece of blatant corruption. Kitchener was also determined to transfer the Wakaf administration from the Khedive's unfettered discretion. Control over the Wakaf gave Abbas Hilmi access to considerable power, influence and riches. 
He was therefore equally determined to resist Kitchener's schemes. His resistance was such that Kitchener at once point thought he would have to be deposed. It is therefore interesting to see that Zaglul and other followers of Abbas Hill Mill organised in the Legislative Assembly a noisy and strenuous opposition to the proposal of transferring control of the Orkaf from the Khedive to the government. In the event, these and other attempts availed, Abbas Hilmi nothing, and he was compelled to follow Kitchener's wishes. His Highness the Khedive, wrote Graham in his memorandum above mentioned, had been hard hit both in his pride and in his pocket by the frustration of the Marriott Railway scheme and the formation of the Wakaf's ministry. He bore a bitter grudge against Mohammed Pasha Sayyid, Although worse for the moment, he was determined to show that no Egyptian ministry, which did not enjoy his confidence, could carry on government for any length of time. In the new assembly, he found a weapon ready to his hand, and had sired Zaglul, a man who could make great use of it. Graham's description of Zaglul's behaviour in the assembly indicates how even then, and even on such a restricted stage, so Zaglul showed talents and powers which were to bring him to the fore some five years later. Sired Pasha Zaglul, Graham went on, was the dominating personality throughout the session, and he has the makings of a successful demagogue. Able and eloquent, he was able to sway the House by his speeches, and the lax rules of procedure in force enabled him to speak again and again at the same sitting on the same subjects. In debate, he was more than a match for any of the ministers, none of whom could stand up to him. But when the Khedive left Egypt at the end of the session, Zaglul's chief support was withdrawn, and there were signs of revulsion against him. Mohammed Said was not able for long to withstand Abbas Hillmill's displeasure and was dismissed in the spring of 1914. The Khedive suggested to Kitchener that his successor should be Mustafa Farfami. This, on the face of it, was a surprising choice, since Mustafa Farfami, who had served for many years as chief minister in Cromer's and Gorse's time, had, as Kitchener put it, always loyally supported the British government and had never been known as a friend of the Khedive. He was also Zaglul's father-in-law, and it soon transpired, as Kitchener reported, that he had fallen under his son-in-law's influence, that he proposed to make a clean sweep of pro-British ministers and substitute them for others, who were chiefly distinguished from their devotion to Saad. Kitchener tried without success to make Mustafa Farmi change his attitude, which I can only ascribe to some promise given to his son-in-law in the matter. It was Hussein Rushdie, who in the end was appointed chief minister, when he was in Istanbul, just before his de- deposition, Abbas addressed a telegram of condolence to Zaglul on the death of his father-in-law, which, as Hussein Rushdie reported to the Khedive, created a bad impression at the residency, being interpreted as an incitement to opposition. When Abbas was deposed and Hussein Kamil appointed Sultan in his place, he and Hussein Rushdie seemed to have thought it prudent to get Zaglul on their side by offering him office, but in view of his factious opposition in relations with Khedive in the last session of the Legislative Assembly, Milne Cheatham, who was in charge of the residency, refused with great approval to entertain such a proposal. With this refusal, and with the Legislative Assembly's prorogue since the outbreak of the war, Zaglul had for the time being no public role to play, but he made a show of loyalty to the deposed Khedive, and thus indicated that he was an opponent of the protectorate of those Egyptians who supported it. In a conversation with Sir William Brunyate, the judicial adviser, some time before Sultan Hussein Kemal's death in 1917, he protested against the continued prorogation of the Assembly. When Brunyat said that he would have been in favour of convoking it so that it might swear allegiance to Sultan Hussein, Zaglul replied that having upon election sworn allegiance to the Khedive, he would not personally have felt at liberty at that time to swear allegiance to the new Sultan. Towards the end of November 1917, Sultan Fuad, who had the that year unexpectedly succeeded his brother, twice asked that two ministers who were in office at his accession should be dismissed because of their alleged corruption or moral turpitude, and that Zaglul and Abd al-Aziz Fahmi, a well-known lawyer, should be substituted for them. This request was supported by Hussein Rushdie, who was still the chief minister. Wingate, who had succeeded Makmahar as high commissioner, was not inclined to oppose an immediate and categorical rejection to Fawad's request. That was the inclusion of Zaglul and Fahmi, will give the reconstituted ministry a somewhat stronger nationalistic tendency. He wrote to Lord Harginge at the Foreign Office, is undoubted, but on the other hand, I am not altogether adverse to this. As matters stand at present, Zaglul, as Vice President of the Legislative Assembly, with his powers of oratory, has acquired a very predominant position, and I am not at all sure that we would not be wise to secure his support on the side of the government rather than have him in opposition. 
but his appointment was once again turned down. This was due to Wingate's suspicion that in proposing this change of ministers, both Fawad and Rushdie were trying to challenge British control and enlarge their own power and Egyptian autonomy. Resistance to this was a matter of principle, and Wingate therefore was told that if the Sultan continued to press for the changes, he should agree to one minister only being dismissed and to Abd al-Aziz Fahmi being appointed for a probationary period as an undersecretary. Therefore, a year or two, matters rested, but it would seem that Fawad continued privately to maintain close relations with Zaglul, who together with Ismail Siddiq, Abd al-Aziz Fahmi and Amin Yahya constituted what Wingate called Fawad's officine nocturne, and which he added the ministers did not like. These were the immediate antecedents, as they were known to the High Commissioner of the man who came to visit him on the 13th of November 1918. They were, of course, quite unknown to the general public, among whose Zagul's reputation remained as that of an independent, opposition-minded politician, who had for years kept aloof from court, residency and public office. But Wingate knew, if not at the time, then soon afterwards, that Zaglul's visit had been concerted with the Sultan and his ministers. The world's accession to the Sultanate had been unexpected. But for the deposition of Abbas Hillmill, the early death of his successor, Hussein Kamil, the refusal of his son to succeed him, and his unacceptability to the British government, Fawad would not have become Sultan. Wingate was not very enthusiastic about his candidature and would have himself have preferred outright annexation of Egypt, but the Foreign Office, concerned with the possibility of discontent among the Egyptian official classes, if Egypt were to be made into a crown colony, and swayed by Sir Ronald Graham's view that Fawad was generally acceptable and at any rate not Anglophone in his sympathies, decided that he should be offered the succession. When he became Sultan, then, Fawad had a position to make secure and consolidate, an authority to sustain and increase, and this in the face of Abbas Hilmi's still unextinguished claim to the throne, his minister's greater experience of affairs and of the British control, which since the outbreak of the war had become even more burdensome, demanding and meticulous. Even the most Anglophile sultan placed in Fawad's position would sooner or later, in attempting to consolidate his position, have a bound to create difficulties for Britain, and in fact, soon after his accession, signs began to multiply that he was not the complacent puppet which some had expected him to be. Indications were not wanting that Fawad was determined to aggrandise himself at expense both of his ministers and of the British. His office in Nocturne was one straw in the wind, but there were others, when Edwin Montague, the Secretary of State for India, visited Egypt in the autumn of 1917, Fawad received him, and he informed Wingate, told Montague that he hoped that Egypt would be granted full autonomy in due course. The etiquette of a reigning sovereign or something like it, wrote Simeon Cheatham in August 1918. Having introduced at Abdeen, and on one occasion the Sultan withdrew without bidding farewell to the High Commissioner at all. The general tone of his reception of British officials and residents has aroused outspoken discontent, and it was clear Cheatham also remarked that Fawad wanted to make himself the active head of society in Egypt. Fawad also began to profess dissatisfaction with his chief minister, Hussein Rushdie, and other ministers complained vehemently to the residency about him. Adli was quite contemptuous of the Sultan. Fawat complained of the interference of the palace in cases before the official religious courts in which Amin Yahya, a member of the Opposine, was involved. Siri, the Minister of Works, also complained that credits for the decoration of Abdeen Palace were being exceeded on Fawad's instructions. At the same time as he reported these difficulties, Wingate also took the view that Fawad's relations with Hussein Rushdie were on the mend, but he warned that, judging from the tendencies the Sultan is now exhibiting, I should be rather afraid that with a return to more normal times, he might be tempted to encourage the opposition of a more or less nationalist character with which the government in all probability will have to deal. A development of this kind would be a repetition of the situation in 1914, when Abbas Hilmi supported any elements in the chamber which were opposed to the government. The present sultan, he went on, is little known in Egypt, he was brought up abroad and when residing here has chiefly lived among foreigners. It is commonly believed that we put him in as a weak man who would serve our own ends. Hitherto he has failed to gain the public esteem which Hussein Kamel enjoyed, and he may be likely therefore to take a line which would bring him popularity and a position which he lacks. As the war was coming to a close, less than a month before Zaglul's fateful interview, Fawad again reiterated to win get his dissatisfaction with his ministers. He gave expression to his desire for home rule for Egypt on the lines of President Wilson's 14 points. Wingate had already warned that Fawad's thoughts were running in that, this direction. In his dispatch of the 31st of August 1918, he had reported that Haynes, the advisor to the Ministry of the Interior, visiting the Sultan, had remarked that there was no need 
as had once seen the case for British commandants of provincial police. The Sultan interrupted him at this point and said that such questions were for his ministers and did not concern an advisor. It is, of course, added Wingate, one of the theories of advanced nationalism that British advisers should have purely technical functions and not take part in administration in its executive aspects. Now, exactly a week before Zaglul's interview, Fawad spoke to Wingate of his desire for a purely Egyptian ministry, for a national assembly and for a constitutional monarchy. As the sequence was to show, it was most unlikely that Fawad, in speaking thus to Wingate, was moved by a sincere desire to diminish the legally unlimited prerogatives of the Sultanate. His history indicates that he was, as Austin Chamberlain described him, sly, scheming, corrupt and autocratic. What is more likely, then, is that he saw in Zaglul's move, which he had no doubt hoped to control and use for his own ends, a means of increasing his stature and power, just as Abbas Hillmill had done in the case of Mustafa Kamil and his Nationalist Party before he broke for them in 1904. In this autocrat invoking the 14 points, then, we see the first partner in the prolonged game of chess, which lasted from 1919 to 1922, and Allenby, extorting his famous declaration from a reluctant government in London, began the long, painful and humiliating liquidation of the British position in Egypt, which ended at last in the unlikely events of November 1956. Zagul was acting in concert not only with Fouad, but with his ministers as well. These ministers, the principal of whom were Hussein Rushdie and Adil Yakan, had been in office since the outbreak of the war, they had shown loyalty to the occupying power, had acquiesced in the deposition of Abbas and the declaration of the protectorate, and had done their best to comply with the needs of the military. Now that Fawad was on the throne, that peace was about to return, they found their situation extremely weakened, they could be attacked for subservience to the British, or disloyalty to the Ottoman suzerain of Egypt and to the ex-Khadive, and they to take action to protect themselves and to parry the attacks they were bound to come, so that even if they had no desire to claim independence once they found Sagul and Fawad engaging on such a tactic, willy-nilly they had to follow suit and associate themselves with their demands, but in any case they themselves had cause for complaint and a desire to change the modalities of the protectorate as these had developed in the years from 1914 to 1918. In 1914, Kitchener was Consul General. When war broke out, he was on leave in London and was persuaded to remain there and become Secretary of State for war during the hostilities. But the war was not thought likely to last very long, and Kitchener did not want to abandon his Egyptian post. This was why Sir Henry McMahon, an Indian civilian who had just retired from the position of political secretary to the Government of India, was appointed High Commissioner, as the British representative came to be known after the Declaration of the Protectorate as a stopgap measure to keep the post open for Kitchener. Matt Mahon had spent all his official life in British India and had no intimate knowledge of Egypt. Now, Egypt was not India. India was ruled by a tightly knit, compact civil service in which there was an unbroken chain of command, from the district officer in his remote province to the central seat of authority in Delhi. Egypt, under British occupation, on the other hand, was a much more complicated and delicate mechanism to operate, while... There could, of course, be no question that the last words lay with the British representative. Yet his authority was not, and could not be, exercised directly. There was the Khedive, who was the legal ruler of the country. There was his ministers, who were supposed to control and direct the native officials. These ministers were flanked by British advisers at the centre, and their subordinates by British inspectors in the provinces. It was by means of this peculiar diarchy that the views and desires of the occupying power were supposed to be transmitted and enforced. This meant that the British representative had to manage and humour Khedive, ministers and other official persons, and that his position precluded him from that direct exercise of authority, which in a hierarchical civil service, such as that of the British India, was customary as between superior and subordinate. The declaration of the protectorate, the coming of MacMahon, the concentration of large bodies of British and allied troops in Egypt, events all of them precipitated by the outbreak of war, could not but exercise the greatest influence on the modes of British control of Egypt. And this in turn could not but greatly disturb the Egyptian ministers and official classes, as accustomed as they had been to the political and administrative traditions which had grown up from 1882 to 1914, in a private note written in October 1919, Sir Reginald Wingate recorded an interview he had with Sultan Hussein Kamil, while Matt Mahon was still High Commissioner, in which the Sultan bitterly complained of the increased power of the British officials, and stated that the Egypt was then being ruled by a Camorra, of which they were the head. From that same note, it appears that the Sultan complained to Lord Hardinge, who was passing through Egypt, and that his complaint, coinciding with Kitchener's death, resulted in Sir Reginald Wingate, then Governor-General of the Sudan, being appointed to replace Matt Mahon, 
writing to Hardin shortly after assuming his new office, Wingate described how Lord Edward Cecil, the financial advisor, had been given great authority by Matt Mahon, and how everybody, British and Egyptian, was still looking up to him for advancement and promotion. Matt Mahon, it would seem, used Cecil as a kind of prime minister. The chief minister, Hussein Rushdie, became particularly restless. At the end of 1917, when Fawad proposed to appoint Zaglul as a minister, Wingate was somewhat concerned to see Hussein Rushdie put into question the protectorate and its working. In conversation with Brun Yates, he declared that he wanted British supervision limited to finance, foreign relations, justice and the army, and that the advisers should be subordinated to their ministers. He went so far as to suggest that ministers should not exercise power without obtaining parliamentary support. But when Wingate taxed him with harbouring such views, Rushdie hastily disclaimed any immediate intention of introducing a new political programme and dismissed his conversation with Brun Yates as entirely private and of no official significance. Wingate was inclined to not to attach too much importance to Rushdie's outburst, thinking that it was merely an attempt to test the ground, but he warned Hardin's that we must expect a very frank expose of national aspirations when the war is over. But Wingate must have misjudged Rusty's tenacity of views or the strength of the pressures which led him to demand a reconsideration of the protectorate. The lengths to which he was ready to go or to which he was driven may be seen from the way in which he dealt with some proposals of Brunet's dealing with the future of the capitulations and with other constitutional issues. In this confidential document, which had been prepared at the request of the Egyptian ministers, there was no more than a draft to put up for discussion. Brunet proposed the creation of a Senate where the foreign communities of Egypt would be substantially represented and which would have large powers over legislation. Hussein Rushdie took, or professed to take, violent exception to this proposal. He wrote a vehement rejoinder, which together with Brunet's memorandum was just distributed in the provinces and given very wide publicity. Rushdie's behaviour is simple to understand. Once the protectorate was called into question, Rushdie could not afford, out of mere self-protection, to seem indifferent or tepid in such a cause if only because he realised how easy it was for his rivals to brand him as a traitor for having acquiesced in the policies of the British and collaborated with them for so many years. And as the armistice approached, it began to be increasingly clear that various people, each with his own particular motive, were thinking of requesting a reconciliation of the protectorate. Wingate, as has been seen, warned London that some such move could be expected from Fawad, of a mischief minister, who in fact thought of a specific move is not entirely clear. Prince Umar Tusun, a grandson of Sayyid Pasha, the third of Muhammad Ali's sons to succeed him as Wali of Egypt, claims that the idea of challenging the protectorate occurred to him after the publication of President Wilson's 14 points in January 1918. He consulted Muhammad Sayyid, who broached the matter to Zaglul early in October 1918, and the latter promised to discuss it with his friends. Later in October, Umar Tusun himself met Zaglul, who told him that £100,000 were required to organise a campaign against the protectorate. Zaglul and the prince agreed to meet and discuss the matter further. Umar Tusun then happened to be in Cairo on the 11th of November when he heard of the forthcoming interview with Wingate. He tried to take part in the movement, but the Sultan objected to his participation. And it is a fact that Fawad, unsure as he was of his position and afraid of being superseded by either by Abbas Hill Mill or by some other member of his family, that sharply forbid Umar Tusun from taking part any further in the movement against the protectorate. He also took positive steps himself apart, that is, from what he may have inspired his coadjutors in the office in Nocturne to do, to show obliquely, yet unmistakably, that he did not like the protectorate. He sent President Wilson a telegram praising him for his 14 points, but the telegram was sent not through the US Consul General, but for the Telegraph Company. He assured his Egyptian visitors that he was in favour of convoking the Legislative Assembly. He is said to have interested himself very much in the collection of money for the use of Zaglul's delegation, which at Alexandria was organised by his man, Armin Yahya. He is also said to have issued a circular, which was distributed in all the towns and contained many open and concealed ambiguities together with a notification of his wish to be associated with the people in all their desires and share their aspirations. If Umar Tusun and Fawad seem to have had a hand in the events which led to Zaglul's visit to Wingate, as so most probably did Rushdie and Adli, Abd al-Aziz Fahmi, who accompanied Zaglul on the visit to Wingate, says later that Zaglul was quite averse to visiting Wingate and that he only changed his mind when Rushdie and Adli told him that they and the Sultan were agreed on the journey to Europe to demand the rights of Egypt and that it was advisable to have by their side a part of the nation on whom we may rely for the defence of its rights so that we may obtain something from the English.
Thus, it came about that Zaglul, free of official responsibilities, was pushed forward by Fawad and Rushdie. Given this opportunity, Zaglul was able to set the pace and his backers, whether they liked it or not, and had to endorse his demands. As for themselves, it is doubtful whether they really wanted full independence or whether, as is more likely, they would have been content with the definition of the protectorate, which would circumscribe the authority of the British officials and allow the Egyptians more elbow room. In an eloquent note which he wrote for Wingate in December 1918, Hussein Rushdie declared that the protectorate was a label which could be used to designate either outright annexation or a reconciliation of British and Egyptian interests. He wanted to know which it was to be. This was the purpose of the talks which they wanted to hold with the British government in London, and he disclaimed any desire to make the Egyptian question international or to seek to present it before the peace conference. If this was Hussein Rushdie's view, the views of the other Egyptians concerned in Zaglul's move of November were, at the outset, hardly more clear-cut. Fawad, it is safe to say, had started something and was waiting to see how the cat would jump. He had been careful not to commit himself categorically, and at the worst had only to disclaim responsibility and say that it was the fault of his ministers of Zaglul of public opinion. If, however, the British were ready to parlay, he would put himself at the head of the movement and so manoeuvre as to obtain the greatest benefits for himself and his house. If such was the calculation, he was to be sorely disappointed to find that in Zaglul he had an old, wily partner, and that the forces he helped to unleash were no longer under his control. As was Zaglul and his unofficial associates, they also seemed to have ventured hopefully, without really knowing the true extent of their demands or what they would could sa- consider a satisfactory outcome. This was the attitude of Ahmad Lufti al Sayyid, who was a member of Zaglul's group which soon came to be known as the Waft. He told Mohammed Hussein Haikal at the time that the plan, as he saw it, was for Zaglul's Waft to proceed to Paris and lay the Egyptian demands for the peace conference. If they succeeded in this, well and good, if not, then Hussein Rushdie and Adli Yakam would go to London on their own and endeavour to make precise the conditions of the protectorate and set up a true constitutional government for the country. Whether these were the precise views of Zaglul himself, we do not know, but his subsequent behaviour would indicate that he was a man ready to extract the maximum benefit from any favourable opportunity. The answer by the British government to Zaglul's move came quickly. It was a categorical refusal. No Egyptian leader, official or unofficial, was to move out of Egypt to go either to Paris or London. Further, Wingate was rebuked for allowing himself to be trapped into receiving Zaglul's delegation and giving them scope for making these demands. In a telegram of the 2nd of December 1918, Wingate was told that his reception of Zaglul and his colleagues, which was being exploited by them in order to show that their movement was lawful, was unfortunate. The rebuke was less than just, for, as has been seen, Wingate had given plenty of warning of Fawad's and Hussein Rushdie's state of mind, and he could hardly have refused unless he were to behave like an oriental despot, and to receive free men as prominent in Egyptian society as Zaglul and his two friends, it was further Kramer's policy and the tradition which he bequeathed to his successors, of whom Wingate was one of the worthiest, that the British representative in Egypt was accessible to all classes of men and ready to look into and address the grievances of the most insignificant of Egyptians. When Wingate subsequently protested against the reprimand which the Foreign Office had administered, he was told that what struck the authorities here as somewhat unaccountable was the fact that Syed Zaglul and his friends should have, at least so it appears, concerted their action with the Sultan and probably Rushdie Pasha, if not others of the ministers, then have come to you as a deputation without your having any previous knowledge of the subject, objects and aims of their visit. There is little substance in this complaint which reflects rather the prejudice which, as will be seen, ministers and high officials in London entertained against Wingate. For even if Wingate had known exactly beforehand what demands Zaglul and his friends were going to make and had refused to receive them, this would hardly have put an end to the movement which had the Sultan's and Chief Minister's support. For the same reason, the refusal of Zaglul's request was misconceived. If Zaglul, the ministers and the Sultan were acting in consort and they had maintained a united front, what then would the British government do? For then it would come to a trial of strength. Were they prepared for it? There was no indication that the consequences of refusal were seriously considered, for not only was Zaglul himself refused permission to go to Europe, the ministers were also forbidden to do so. It might be that they had been allowed to go to London, as Wingate himself urged that they should. They would have been adroit enough to take the initiative away from Zaglul, and thus enable the British government to break the United Front with Zaglul. The ministers and the Sultan maintained, each for his own particular ends, 
but it is doubtful whether they would have been adroit enough or daring enough to proceed on their own, on knowing that the Sultan would obscurely manoeuvring behind their backs and Zagul ready to denounce any settlement in which he did not have a part. In the event, faced with the British refusal, they resigned and were soon declaring that they would not go to London without Zaglul, obviously fearing that if they left him in Egypt, he would be in a strong position to outbid them. The ministers were prevailed upon to hold back their resignation for the time being, but Wingate found himself in a difficult position between an equivocating sultan, alternately saying that Zaglul and his friends were justified in their demands and his ministers right to resign, and then again saying that the ministers were indispensable and should be prevailed upon to stay in office and that he himself had no sympathy with Zaglul, but dare not disown him, and ministers in part genuinely offended by London's behaviour, and again in part fearful of seeing less extreme than Zaglul, all this while Zaglul, now in the limelight, together with his committee, was organising opposition to the occupying power. The text of a petition asking that Zaglul and his delegation be allowed to travel to Europe to present the Egyptian case was spread throughout the land, and signatures collected for it. The provincial authorities, acting on the instructions of the Ministry of the Interior, attempted to confiscate these petitions. Zaglul, in what may have been a concerted move, protested to Hussein Rushdie against the confiscations. What follows throws light not only on the course of the so-called Egyptian Revolution in 1919, but on the quality of the British administration of Egypt in those years. Hussein Rushdie went with a protest to the advisor of the Ministry of the Interior and asked him what reply should be made. The advisor was then Mr Haynes, who had been an inspector and then chief collector of taxes. He had been made advisor to the interior by McMahon on Lord Edward Cecil's advice. In this post, writes Lord Lloyd, he has made little of the former zeal of, or competence and refused to listen to any sort of criticism or advice, thus cutting off the High Commissioner from his chief source of information. Mr Haynes, as he explained to Wingate, now told Hussein Rushdie to answer the glue by saying that the Petitions were being confiscated by the order of the advisor of the Ministry of the Interior. Hussein Rushdie replied in this sense, the letter was made public and it was plain for, all to see that the Sultan's ministers had no part or lot in putting down Zaglul's movement, that it was purely the doing of the British. But this disassociation of the Egyptian ministers from their British advisers, facilitated by Haynes' extraordinary move, was not the only sign by which the ministers conveyed their approval of Zaglul's movement. There is evidence to show that they took positive steps to facilitate this work. The petition had been sent, writes Mohammed Hussein Heikel, to lawyers, doctors, engineers and other professional people. For these, it was not difficult to, to sign the petitions, since their culture and their appreciation of the meaning of independence were enough to make them eager to sign. But copies of the petition had also been sent to other local elected bodies, such as provincial councils, and to omders and notables, and lo and behold, thousands and hundreds of thousands of these signatures began to come in from every side. This is because Rushdie Pasha's ministry encouraged the Mudirs and the Mamurs, and made them encourage people who were afraid of the power of the government to sign the petitions. Ahmad Shafiq Pasha, in his survey of Egyptian politics, also mentions that the government exerted its influence on behalf of Zaglul's movement and confirms his argument by a speech which Hussein Rushdie made a few years after these events recounting the help which he gave to the WAFD while in office. It was not only the ministers but the palace as well which exerted its influence in the same direction. So Abd al Khalik Farwat, one of Hussein Rushdie's fellow ministers, who it seems had not been consulted about the resignation, told Branyate, adding that false rumours were being spread by the palace staff. A curious effect of these tactics emerges from the story told in a note by Sir Ronald Graham on arrest in Egypt to the effect that a influential provincial notable loyal to the British connection told a British inspector that he had subscribed £10,000 to Zaglul's movement because he understood it and the support of the British and that he gladly cancelled his subscription when he learned to the contrary. Later, in the disturbances which followed the banishment of Zaglul and his friends, some provincial officials took the part of the rioters, others remained passive, the police in some places show indiscipline, and in at least one recorded instance, Egyptian troops incited the mob to destruction. It would seem that, then that the Egyptian resolution of 1919 was at least in instigation and at the beginning a revolution directed from above. While effervescence was mounting in the country, Wingate was endeavouring to make the British government change its policy and make some less categorically negative reply to the Egyptian ministers. The government went so far as to say that they would sometime discuss the issue with Hussein Rushdie and his colleagues, but that Zaglou was on no account to move out of Egypt. Early in the crisis, however, Hussein Rushdie and Adli had declared that they would not go without Zaglou. Their reason was precisely what it had been when they discreetly joined Zaglou in objecting to the protectorate, namely self-protection. 
Immediately after Zaglul's visit to Wingate, Rushdie himself saw the High Commissioner, declared that he had known of Zaglul's scheme and that he and his friends should be given a hearing in London. As it, in the event of their request being refused, charge of inadequate representation of Egyptian questions could not then be brought against responsible Egyptian ministers, as might be the case if only the latter went to London. They continued to argue that it was necessary, both of them and Zaglul, to go to London, so that the latter might be discredited by his failure to gain a hearing from the British government, than which they told Wingate they wished nothing better. Wingate was summoned for consultations to London, arriving there at the end of January 1919. He was left to cool his heels for a fortnight or so, for Curzon, who was in charge of the Foreign Office, while Balfour was at a peace conference in Paris, found the time to see him. Wingate then argued that it would be politic to allow both the ministers and Zaglul to come and present their grievances in London, otherwise it was difficult to form an Egyptian government, and whatever government was formed would be very weak. The departmental view, on the other hand, said a memorandum of the 20th of February 1919, which Curzon sent to Balfour in Paris, is that the nationalist leaders, who have placed themselves at the head of a disloyal movement to expel the British from Egypt, have no claim to be allowed to come here, and that to accede to the demands of the ministers on this head would only be regarded throughout Egypt as a sign of weakness. Further, Egyptian ministers should not be allowed to dictate the terms on which they would come to London. It was quite possible to carry on in Cairo without an Egyptian ministry, contrary to what Wingate had represented. His views were by no means universally shared in Egypt. Balfour agreed with the department view, and a telegram, the draft of which was amended and approved by him, was according to sent to Cheatham on the 26th of February. This telegram, which Bullfour's amendment made even more stringent and categorical, refused permission to any Egyptian to leave Egypt for any reason whatsoever. Thereupon, Rushdie and Adley made their resignation public and final on the 1st of March 1919. One argument which the Foreign Office adduced in favour of its own views was a telegram from Cheatham of the 3rd of February previous in which he stated that in spite of the ministerial crisis, administration had continued without serious inconvenience during the past fortnight. Sir Milne Cheatham had been counsellor at the residency since November 1911. His dispatches show him to have been a competent if colourless subordinate. Gertrude Bell, who had met him in Egypt in 1919, described him as a typical Foreign Office man of the bloodless type. Events were now to show that the responsibility which he had to shoulder during Wingate's absence were quite beyond him. He had begun by being overconfident, allowed himself to be manoeuvred by Fouad into taking a rash action, and when its results proved untoward, he gave way to panic. He started by sending reports which represented Zaglul and his ministerial sympathisers as having lost popularity and the country as quiet and peaceful. There seems no reason, he said in a telegram of the 24th of February, why Zaglul's movement should affect the decision of the British government on constitutional questions and the proper form to be given to the protectorate. A few days later, however, Zaglul took an action which had the most far-reaching repercussions. When the minister's resignation was made known, he visited the royal palace at the head of a delegation and delivered a minatory letter for the sultan to deter him from trying to form another ministry. We know, the letter said, that your highness may have been compelled by family reasons to accept the throne, but the nation, on the other hand, believes that your acceptance of the throne during the temporary and illegal protectorate, out of regard for those family circumstances, should not turn your highness away from the working for the independence of your country. People, therefore, have wondered how your highness's councillors did not pay regard to the nation in this difficult period. The nation asked your highness to be the first one to come to its help in attaining independence, however much this might cost your highness, however it can be escaped, your highness's councillors, that the terms of Rushdie's Pasha's resignation do not allow any honourable and patriotic Egyptian to take his place. Now can it have escaped them that a ministry formed on a programme contrary to the will of the people is doomed to failure? We do not advise our lord falsely when we beg him to acquaint himself with the opinion of his nation, before taking a final decision concerning the present ministry. To stand between the nation and its demands is a responsibility which the councillors of our lords have not scrutinised with the requisite precision. The erstwhile member of the officine nocturne was giving notice to his coadjutor that he could not so easily wriggle out of his schemes, that even if he were tempted to give in to the obstinacy of the British, Ziegler would not allow it. Cromer's Girondist was turning Jacobin. The Wards refused to see the allegation which brought this letter and immediately appealed to Cheatham for protection from further insults. In a telegram of the 6th of March, the latter stated that he had 
consulted the principal advisors who agreed with him that the proper course was to intern Zagul and his followers outside Egypt. I recommended, Cheatham concluded, his immediate arrest and deportation, and for the sake of the Sultan's prestige, which is of political interest to us, I would beg for an early decision. And the prompt decision he did get, entirely guided by Cheatham's estimate of the situation during the past month, the Foreign Office on the 7th of March authorised the deportation of Zaglul and three of his companions who on the 9th of March were arrested and sent to Malta. Reporting the deportation, Sir Milne Cheatham opined that the action for which Sir Sultan had expressed his warm thanks would be sufficient for the movement. The world's gratitude was short-lived. At the end of March, in answer to a parliamentary question, the government stated that His Highness had appealed to the Acting High Commissioner for protection against verbal insults and intimidations hence the deportations. By then, extensive disorders had broken out in Egypt. Allenby had superseded Wingate, and Zagul and his friends were being widely acclaimed as liberators and martyrs. The Sultan, therefore, rejected with indignation the slur on his patriotism. What he had done was merely to show the petition of the 5th of March to Cheatham, and it was the latter and not himself who had recommended action. His Highness, therefore, demanded that it should not be made clear that it was the British government who, acting on the advice of their representative, were wholly responsible for the deportations, Curzon was not willing to concede this without further discussion, but with his characteristic impatience, Alan B. cut short the debate and issued a statement in Cairo magnanimously, accepting full responsibility on behalf of the British government. I've done this in agreement with Sultan, he told Curzon in the telegram on the 1st of April. Cheatham's coup de force, then, had immediately been followed by widespread and serious disorders. Mobs writing in Cairo, Alexandria and the principal provincial cities telegraph wires cut rail tracks destroyed, Englishmen killed. To judge by his dispatches immediately previous to the rising, Cheatham did not have the slightest suspicion of impending trouble. His deportation of Zaglul and his companions makes sense only on the assumption that here was a handful of mere agitators who, once out of the way, would be deprived of any power for mischief, and yet Cheatham must have known that Zaglul was acting in concert with the Sultan and the Ministry, and that officials and notables taking their cue from Cairo had, ever since the previous November, when spreading petitions and propaganda in favour of Zaglul's delegation. Deporting Zaglul and his friends was not, then, to strike at the basis of the agitation, to have done it furthermore at Fawad's instance showed a dangerous readiness to be bamboozled. Cheatham also must have known, or if he did not, he ought to have known that after four years of war, conditions in Egypt were such to make the country dangerously responsive to the agitations. These conditions were, either directly or indirectly, largely the outcome of Egypt being made to supply the demands imposed on it by the British army, which naturally was concerned first and foremost to fight the war against the Ottomans. When Egypt had been declared a protectorate, the British government solemnly stated that Egypt would not have to bear any burdens by reason of the war. This was presumably done in the expectation of a short war, but as the conflict lengthened and extended, the army began to press for the supply of labour and animals. An Egyptian labour corps was set up, entry into which was supposed to be voluntary. As the demands of the army increased, through the voluntary principle, was not overtly abandoned, yet pressures began to be applied through the Egyptian administration and ultimately through the village Omdaz to obtain more recruits. These pressures haphazardly, capriciously, corruptly and abusively applied gave a bad name to British rule among the fellows. Or was this not a return to the corvée, the ending of which had been one eloquent vindication of British rule? How little consonant with British methods these practices were, realised at the time, in the dispatch of the 15th of September 1918, Wingate admitted that such methods were not in agreement with general sentiment and character of our occupation in Egypt, and that they obviously opened the door to abuses which British officials could not possibly prevent. The Omdas were given this large and discretionary power, not only in respect of labour recruitment, but also in respect of requisition both of animals and of produce, and there was little doubt that they used these large and arbitrary powers to enrich themselves, to settle old scores, and generally to tyrannise over the villages. If there was a ground for blaming Wingate for the events of March, then it is this, that it did not resist with sufficient vigour the insatiable demands of Allenby and of the War Office for manpower and supplies, or at any rate did not organise recruitment and requisition in a way which was not open to abuse. The war also led to authorities drastically to strip the acreage of cotton, the most lucrative crop, so that more foodstuffs could be grown. Imports also became scarce, Prices rose and inflation set in which bore heavily on the poorer classes in the cities who, in the words of a memorandum by the Financial Secretary of the Egyptian Ministry of Finance, had been unable to cope with the higher cost of living only by the exercise of severe economy and by a reduction in the consumption of necessaries to an extent incompatible 
with the maintenance of an adequate standard of existence. The very war which produced these strains in Egypt at the same time weakened British control over the administration. British officials found their energies absorbed by the overriding demands of the war, their numbers were depleted and a high standard of recruitment, hitherto customary, could no longer be maintained. The resulting administrative slackness did not redound to the credit of the British name. This slackness also became apparent at a time when the country was filled with a vast military base, for which moved large constrict proletarian armies, who knew nothing about the rules or the behaviour current in a Muslim society. Their contact frequently scandalised the population, and contrasted strongly with the decorum which Egyptians had been accustomed to associate with Englishmen, whom they now began to see with new, much less respectful eyes. One of the most perceptive witnesses to appear before the Milner mission, an inspection of the interior, Mr A. Wellesley, drew attention to the decline in respect for the British in Egypt. He attributed it to the lower standards and the lower class of the British official appointed to Egypt in late years, and to the influx of large numbers of soldiers whose manners were at best indifferent. The sort of English official who did harm, he said, was the official of what he might call the NCO class. Of course, the war had done incalculable damage to the prestige of British officials. The Egyptians now had experience of ill-mannered and disorderly British officers, whom they saw associating with officials and they were not apt to differentiate. Beyond these conditions, there were others, perhaps less tangible, which served further to complicate and aggravate the disturbance brought about by the war. The very peace and prosperity which accompanied the British occupation had perhaps unleashed the Amalthusian devil in Egypt. The population was constantly on the increase, and it pressed ever more relentlessly on the limited resources of an essentially agrarian economy, which, moreover, was at the mercy of world economic conditions. It may be, therefore, that ever without the war and the strains it occasioned, Egypt was gradually becoming more difficult to manage and govern. This general increase in population necessarily also led to an increase in the size of the cities, which, in a process accelerated by the war, were becoming gradually swollen with migrants from the countryside. This constituted a miserable and volatile mass, easy to rouse and difficult to control. The disturbances of March 1919 saw their ominous emergence onto the scene of Egyptian politics. In Cairo, in Alexandria, in the tightly packed towns of the Delta, they rioted, killed and looting, providing a vivid illustration of the problem of government with the increase in population was creating. Egypt then was going through a series of malaise, with the Syrian Sultan and his ministers and Zaglul had begun to exploit. Cheatham, as had been said, seemed to have no inkling of this malaise, of its character, or of the way in which it was being manipulated. Having displayed an excess of confidence before Zaglul was deported, after a few days of disorder, he went to the other extreme and assumed that the disorders were the expression of a movement which, as he put it in a telegram on the 17th of March, was national in the full sense of the word, a movement which had, apparently, the sympathy of all classes and creeds, including the cops. In speaking thus, Cheatham showed a readiness to accept at face value the slogans of the Cairo politicians. He assumed, uncritically, that the city mob and the peasants on the rampage were moved not by specific distempers and concrete, albeit obscure discontents, but by the abstract clichés, the use of which the official classes had so readily learnt from Europe. Cheatham had deported Seglul on the 9th of March. Disorders had almost immediately broken out in the cities and the villages of the Delta and in Upper Egypt. By the 15th of March, the acting High Commissioner had completely lost his nerve. On that day, he sent two telegrams, in the first marked very urgent. He reported that the disorders were continuing and went on to make a suggestion which clearly demonstrated his utter lack of judgment. Would it, he asked, represent any inconvenience from wider political point of view if so-called Egyptian patriots were to visit France and England, whether or not any of them were granted official recognition in London? The second telegram, also very urgent, announced that disorders were continuing, that a grave situation was developing, and that General Watson, commanding the troops in Egypt, agreed that there was a danger of an outbreak of fanaticism. This danger made it necessary to discover some ground for reconciliation, and he might want to recommend a concession to native feeling. He therefore wanted an urgent answer to his previous telegram. Two days later, he again insisted that a concession was necessary. In his panic, Cheatham went further. He tried to enlist the help of the United States in persuading his government to authorise a concession. He sent for the American Consul General on the 18th of March and told him that, at no time since the Arabi Rebellion in 1882 has the state of affairs been so critical. He was, he said, unable to obtain instructions from London and intimidated, so the Consul General reported in a telegram, that he desired to me the report the serious conditions to my government in the hope that it would exert promptly some influence over his own government and thus make them appreciate the gravity of the situation. 
Cheatham also wanted to enlist the help of the Consul General in restoring order in Egypt. In a later addition to his telegram, the Consul General reported that Cheatham had called him to the residency to tell me that the situation is getting beyond control and to ask if I will be prepared to help in the matter if the worst comes. Curzon at the Foreign Office did not receive Cheatham's suggestions well. To allow the Egyptians to come to London after their disturbances, he sensibly told Cheatham in a telegram by the 17th of March, would make it appear that we were yielding to force when persuasion has failed of its effect. Curzon also informed Balfour in Paris that he was opposed to Cheatham's proposals, adding that he felt the acting High Commissioner was not fully able to cope with the situation. Balfour's advisers in Paris agreed with Curzon. Van Sittart, who knew Egypt, having served in the residency before the war, minuted Cheatham's telegram of the 15th of March advising concessions. Having originally refused, it is now more difficult for us to give away without loss of prestige. In his telegram of the 16th of March, informing Balfour of his reaction to Cheatham's suggestions, Curzon also proposed letting Cairo know that the British government was prepared to receive the Egyptian ministers, but not Zaglul and his friends, in London. This, observed Van Sittart in a minute, might have met the situation a few months before, whether it would now was doubtful, but it was at any rate worth trying. Such, it would seem, was the tenor of the advice which Balfour received. This, at any rate, is what the available papers show. The action which Balfour now took thus became quite inexplicable. Answering Curzon on the 18th of March, he began by saying that the restoration of order and the formation of a competent government must be immediately and unconditionally carried through. Once this was done, the British government would be ready to discuss with the Egyptian ministers the grievances of Egypt. Then Balfour added the following, If they, i.e. the Egyptian ministers, think their task would be better performed if they were accompanied or immediately followed by persons qualified to represent the nationalist case, even in its extreme form, I can see no objection. This telegram, drafted in Balfour's own hand, seems to concede what Hussein Rushdie had demanded and what the British government had hitherto resisted, namely that in any negotiations with the British government, the Glul should accompany the ministers. Why did Balfour propose making such a vital concession? Curzon, he knew, advised against it, and so did Van Sittart. Could he have been impressed by one of Cheatham's telegrams on the 15th of March, in which he stated that General Watson also believes a concession necessary? All that can be said is that this particular telegram adjoins in the file, Balfour's draft of the telegram of the 18th of March. The matter becomes all the more puzzling when another telegram of Balfour's, which immediately followed, is considered. Sent as an urgent private and personal telegram, it performs Curzon that the preceding telegram contained the best personal advice I can give in the circumstances, but I am fully conscious that I have but an incomplete knowledge of the Egyptian situation, and I have not with me in Paris any member of my staff who is fully equipped to assist me. If this was the case, why did Balfour feel it incumbent on him to give these instructions? Was it that, as Curzon complained, behind his charm and intellectual distinction, there lay ignorance, indifference and levity? That he never studied his papers or knew the facts or looked ahead? That he trusted to his unequalled powers of improvisation to take him through any trouble and, and enable him to leap lightly from one crisis to another? Was this episode perhaps yet another instance of the ruinous consequences which the war and its aftermath had on the machinery of government? Would it have happened had ministers and officials not been scattered between London and Paris, rushed, harried and overworked? How else to explain the zigzag of conflicting policies and divergent views of which ministers and their advisers seemed sometimes to have only the haziest notion? On the 18th of March, as had been seen, Balfour confessing his inability to reach an informed decision, yet orders a sudden, quite unexplained and most injudicious reversal of policy. But the permanent Undersecretary of State, who was there at his side in Paris, does not seem to have known of his decision. For we find Hardinge on the 19th of March, that is, the following day, writing from Paris to Wingate to say that he and Balfour had discussed Cheatham's proposed concessions, and we were strongly of opinion that there could be no question of any concession until order had been restored and government formed. We both of us felt that no concession is possible so long as disorders prevail and no government had been formed. We must conclude that unless Hardinge wanted deliberately to mislead Wingate, he himself was in the dark as to Balfour's actual views. Balfour's intervention, however, did not have any immediate consequences. When his two telegrams of the 18th of March were received at the Foreign Office, Sir Ronald Graham minuted, With all due respect, I submit that this does not help us. We are, and always have been, ready to discuss matters with Egyptian ministers, but we cannot allow them to bring the nationalist leaders with them without reversing our whole previous attitude. It seems that Lord Mr Balfour desires to leave the whole question in Lord Curzon's hands, and that further re reference to Paris would be unnecessary. Curzon agreed and to another telegram of the 19th of March from Cheatham, insisting that the whole solution lay in allowing extremists to leave Egypt and present their case where they want, wished. 
he replies on the 22nd of March that the first and essential consideration was to restore law and order, that Cheatham was to transmit all proposals coming from Egyptians and say that they could not receive consideration until law and order was restored. When Wingate learned of the disorders and of Cheatham's proposed concessions, his own advice, recorded in the memorandum of the 21st of March, was that immediate repressive measures were necessary. I do seriously doubt, he asserted, the soundness giving way to the nationalist demands after they had committed such gross acts of lawlessness. But though Cheatham was not to remain much longer in authority, the High Commissioner's advice did not override his account, his own. For Wingate and his views had become of little account at the Foreign Office, and it was soon to be superseded, his sudden and brutal relegation and the appointment of Allenby over his head as Special High Commissioner and remote causes little connected with the present emergency. They dated rather from the time of his transfer to Cairo, where he replaced Matmahon. The latter, having had no previous experience of Egypt, seems to have relied on and been guided to a large extent by the senior British officials of the Egyptian government, particularly Lord Edward Cecil, the financial advisor, and Brunyate, the judicial advisor. On succeeding him, Wingate seems to have been determined to restore to the High Commissioner the power and influence which Matmahon had allowed to pass into the hands of the advisers. This seems to have been resented and to have created enmities for Wingate. There was, in particular, friction between him and Cecil, which no doubt came to the notice of his uncle Balfour and his brother, Lord Robert Cecil. Brunyate, too, may have been put it about that Wingate was not in control of the situation. This certainly was not the tenor of a memorandum, which he later sent to the Milner mission, describing Wingate as having been too tired for his responsibilities and too unacquainted with modern Egyptian conditions. Among the officials at the Foreign Office, Sir Ronald Graham, who dealt with Egyptian affairs, was one of his detractors. Graham had served as advisor to the Ministry of the Interior at Cairo and had had the ambition of succeeding Matmahon, and this may have played its part in shaping his attitude of extreme depreciation towards the language which Wingate had adopted in dealing with Zaglul and his friends at the interview of the 13th of November 1918. It is regrettable, he wrote in the minute of the 25th of November 1918, that these three Egyptians received an encouragement from the Sultan, but this confirms the recent reports we have had that the residency in the palace are not working in as close a harmony and contact as they thought to be. I also regret that Sir R. Wingate did not turn down these nationalists in much firmer language than he seems to have used. The only feature of the agitation in Egypt which caused him some misgiving, he wrote in another minute of the 29th of November, was the half-hearted attitude adopted by the residency towards it. The extremist leaders ought never to have been received by Sir R. Wingate, except for the purpose of being told not to make fools of themselves. Again, in the minute of the 7th of December, he asserted that the root of the whole trouble was that Wingate did not know how to manage Fawad and his wholehearted support. For without the Sultan's tacit acquiescence, if not approval, we should never have had any open nationalist agitation, still less resignation of ministers. In the last assertion, Graham was undoubtedly right, but he had no grounds for thinking that Wingate could have cajoled or persuaded Fouad into giving up his ambitions or his intrigues. He was even further out when in a memorandum on the unrest in Egypt, quoted above, which was written in April 1919, he asserted that Wingate's handling of his interview with Zaglul had placed the British government at the outset in a position from which it was difficult to recover. For at that interview, Wingate had committed neither himself nor his superiors, and it was mere fault-finding to argue that his reception of Zaglul at the residency encouraged the agitation and made it look respectable. But at the Foreign Office, it was not Graham alone who disapproved of Wingate. Graham's minute of the 29th of November, mentioned above, is followed on the file by a minute of the same date in which Sir Ear Crow recorded that Sir R. Wingate seems deplorably weak. And it was Crow who added in the draft of the telegram sent to Wingate on the 2nd of December 1918, which is quoted above, the phrase to the effect that his reception of Zaglul was unfortunate. A fortnight or so before Wingate's supersession, Symes, his private secretary, told him of reports emanating from Cairo that he was tired out, that he was encouraging natives, that the chance of High Commissioner was inevitable, and that when Wingate left Cairo and did not resign, a suggestion was actually put up to the Cabinet that a change in Cairo was desirable. These rumours were significant and indicated with every reasonable accuracy the direction into which things were tending. For as nearly as the beginning as January 1919, Wingate's removal from Egypt was being seriously considered. I have sent this telegram to Wingate, wrote Lord Robert Cecil to Balfour on the 4th of January 1919, preparatory to his recall if you decide on that course. 
Before sending it, I spoke to the Prime Minister and suggested that if Wingate was recalled, Allenby would be a suitable successor. This he warmly approved, and so did the CIGS, to whom I mentioned it confidentially. But the Prime Minister wanted nothing done which would preclude Wingate's return to Egypt if that were decided on. I hope the telegram leaves the matter quite open, but I ought to add, he concluded, that everyone to whom I have spoken about Wingate is confident that he's not up to the job. The outbreak which followed Siglaw's deportation forced a decision on Wingate's future. In his telegram to Balfour on the 16th of March, quoted above, Curzon, while noting Cheatham's incapacity, did not propose that Wingate should return to Cairo. He too wanted Allenby to take charge of Egypt, obviously in the belief that he would be more firm and decisive. I understand, he told Balfour, that arrives in Paris tomorrow and I will not be free to return for a few days. Will you consult with him as he steps to be taken? A few days later, on the 19th of March, Curzon sent another telegram, drafted by Graham, reminding Balfour that Allenby was arriving in Paris on that day, and added, I am sure you will be agree that to his early return to Egypt is advisable. Balfour and Lloyd George acted very promptly. The next day, um, 20th of March, Curzon was told that Allenby was appointed Special High Commissioner in Egypt, the title being an echo of the title of Special Commissioner, which Lord Dufferin was given when he was sent to investigate conditions in Egypt after the Urabi movement, and that he was proceeding to Egypt forthwith. In his memoirs, Hardin just stated that in appointing Allenby, both Balfour and Lloyd George desired to restore British prestige by administering strong measures, and that the Prime Minister imagined that in him he had found a strong man who would impose the views of the British government upon the Sultan and would defeat the Nationalists. That this was Lloyd George's expectation is most probable, but whether Balfour was of the same mind is more doubtful. His telegram of the 18th of March is not easy to reconcile with a firm or coherent policy. What is more likely is that he had come to entertain a prejudice against Wingate, the necessity of whose removal looms perhaps larger in his eyes than the exact character and policy of his successor. In his memoirs, Hardinge asserts that he was doubtful of Allenby's ability to rule Egypt, which, he thought, required a skilled diplomatist and administrator, and that he pressed these considerations very strongly on Balfour. Of such representations, the available papers afford us no evidence, but Hardinge opposed Allenby's appointment, his language here indicates that this was not done in Wingate's cause. It was Graham's merits which Hardinge must have pressed. When Balfour informed Curzon of Allenby's appointment, he added to his telegram a secret and personal paragraph to the effect that Allenby's appointment, a special high commissioner, would not of itself displace Wingate, who would for the present retain the post of high commissioner. It is probable, Balfour added, that he will not return, though an immediate decision on this point is not necessary. Wingate himself was told in the telegram of the same date that the emergency in Egypt made it necessary for Allenby to be given both civil and military authority, but that this makes no technical change in your position. For many months, Wingate was left in suspense. The only information he was about safe, is if such it can be called, was contained in a letter from Balfour, the terms of which, deliberately obscure and ambiguous, were carefully designed to mislead its recipient. As long as Allenby was dealing with the existing crisis, the Foreign Secretary informed the High Commissioner on the 26th of March 1919, your services will hardly be required. How long this exceptional period will continue and what shape the future government of Egypt will take, neither I nor any other man can say with confidence. Wingate remained until the autumn of 1919, formerly the High Commissioner, but it was completely ignored and kept aside. On one crucial occasion, shortly after Allenby's appointment, as will be seen, Curzon did ask for his advice, but its soundness did not prevent it once again being dismissed. Wingate did attempt once to extract an explanation of the, the treatment to which he had been subjected. He went to Curzon in June 1919 and demanded that an official inquiry should be held into his conduct of affairs in Egypt. Not surprisingly, Curzon found the demand embarrassing. He wrote to Balfour in Paris that he proposed to tell Wingate that no reflection whatever had been cast on his conduct and that Allenby had originally been sent because of his military prestige. The movement in Egypt, however, had proved wider than anticipated. Normality was not yet restored and it was undesirable, therefore, and impossible to suspend Allenby from the discharge of his duties, since this might involve a revival of the troubles. He was proposing to confirm Allenby in his position and to him, Wingate, who was offering a peerage. All this, Curzon added, was on the assumption which I gathered in Paris that it is not desirable that Wingate should go back as High Commissioner to Cairo. Balfour replied on the 9th of June they had consulted the Prime Minister, who agreed to the offer for peerage provided Wingate undertook not to raise the question of his dismissal in the House of Lords. It is not, Balfour went on, an easy situation to handle. Wingate is a good fellow and he's been a very valuable and distinguished public servant. 
He gave specific advice on a difficult problem, warning us that if his advice was not followed, trouble would ensue. Thereupon, we practically tell him that he's not the man most competent to deal with the situation that's created and that somebody else must be put in his place. This, I take it, is the skeleton of the story and it is not one very easy to clothe in attractive flesh and blood. In the extenuation of the government's behaviour, Walthall added two points. One, that the rejection by the government of Wingate's advice was justified by the facts of then known and that the subsequent troubles were not its results. Two, that Wingate, after all that has passed, is not the man to deal with this particular kind of crisis at this particular moment. Neither point has much weight. It is quite difficult to see how the facts as then known justified the government's rejection of Wingate's advice unless by facts is meant the prejudice against Wingate that accumulated in the minds of ministers and officials. As for Balfour's second point, if Wingate was not the man to deal with the crisis, then Allenby, the judge by his record, was even less qualified. Wingate was not in the end offered a peerage. He was made a baronet and offered the governorship of the Strait Settlements, which he turned down. He had also to engage in a long, wearisome and petty controversy with the war office about the amount of pension due to him. Allenby reached Cairo on the 25th of March, but both Lloyd George and Curzon looked to him to use that firmness in which they believed Wingate to be deficient. There was no evidence to show whether Allenby was given in Paris an idea of Balfour's rather different attitude, or whether he was informed of the text of Balfour's telegram of the 18th of March, which, as has been seen, was disregarded by the Foreign Office and not transmitted to Cairo. The fact remains that immediately on arrival at Cairo, he espoused the policy of that telegram and made his own Cheatham's proposals, which both Curzon and Wingate had condemned as ill-judged and dangerous. In doing so, he may have been influenced by the views of his chief political officer, Sir Gilbert Clayton. As early as the 17th of March, Clayton considered that the movement in Egypt should be met by a generous recognition of legitimate Arab aspirations and a readiness to consider reasonable requests. It's Mr Cheatham's proposals which might serve as a basis for settlement. Among them was one to the effect that if if suitable delegates wanted to go to London, no objection would be offered, and those individuals of the Nationalist Committee, who were recently deported, would not be prevented from accompanying the delegation if so desired. A letter of his to Wingate, written the following April, makes clear the assumptions on which he proceeded. I cannot disguise from myself, he wrote, that the principles of nationalism and the desire for independence have bitten deep into all classes. And I am convinced that our policy in Egypt must be very carefully reconsidered on lines of increased sympathy with national aspirations, so far as they keep within legitimate limits. Clayton then believed that the unrest of Egypt was caused by the denial of independence or autonomy, as Zaglul and the politicians claimed, and that therefore the remedy for the unrest lay in treating with Zaglul and his friends and in working towards a political settlement on the lines which these politicians have and embraced it thus followed that for him Zaglul's deportation had been a mistake and his release by Allenby a necessary measure, as it was better to cut losses rather than persist in the error. Clayton's views, as Allenby would soon have discovered, were now faithfully echoed at the residency, where Cheatham, in order to persuade his masters in London, had in a telegram on the 17th of March, already quoted, held out the prospect of cooperation by moderates. If the concessions he advocated were authorised, Immediately on his arrival at Cairo, Allenby adopted Clayton's and Cheatham's views. He was clearly out of his depth in Egyptian politics and accepted uncritically the opinion that, as he put it in a telegram on the 20th of April 1919, Zaglul's represented the opinion of the majority of Egyptian intellectuals. As though Egyptian intellectuals were a known or intelligible entity, as though their opinions, whatever they were or however ascertained, had an overriding or primordial importance, and as though it made the smallest sense in such a situation to speak, except in the loosest and most misleading manner, of representation or representativeness, but Allenby's mind was made up almost as soon as he reached Cairo, and perhaps even before. Mr Patterson, then Director General of State Accounts, testifies to this in a memorandum which must have been written shortly afterwards. The release of the four, i.e. Zaglul and his fellow deportees, he wrote, was I think in Sir Edmund's mind from the beginning, I saw him, written within 24 hours of his arrival, and he hinted as much. I respectfully pointed out that I thought their return would make all government impossible, and as the High Commissioner made no comment on my remark, I received the impression that he disagreed with it. On 31st of March, Allenby informed Curzon that he had sent for the ex-ministers Rushdie and Adley, and that they had asked him to remove restrictions on the departure of would-be travellers from Egypt, including the deportees. This concession, he said, without conferring any official recognition generally from me, would automatically restore tranquillity and guarantee information of a ministry, 
with whom fruitful discussion would be possible. This precipitate proposal, buttressed as it was by the glib and unconvincing arguments, was received with dismay by Curzon in London. He was, he wrote in a letter of the 1st of April to Volfort, much startled by this advocacy of a policy which had been resisted since the previous November. Allenby, he thought, was misjudging the situation in its wider aspect by putting all the emphasis on the necessity of forming an Egyptian ministry. But he was to find no support either from Balfour or from Lloyd George. Allenby's appointment was doing, and they did not dare, as Hardinge points out, disavow or even oppose his policies. Prime Minister and I, Balfour, telegrammed to Curzon on the 2nd of April. I have an opinion that as Allenby has, was appointed Special High Commissioner of Egypt, his advice cannot be disregarded. It is important, he emphasised, to avoid any appearance of mistrusting his present policy. And Balfour ended his telegram by saying that Allenby's policy was not, in essence, inconsistent with the suggestions he had made in his own telegram of the 18th of March. Curzon now called Wingate to his aid, the High Commissioner, and this was his last intervention in Egyptian affairs, now wrote a note in which he stated that he differed most strongly from Allenby's advice. The nationalists, he pointed out prophetically, all say, and with justice, that by agitation and intimidation they have forced the hands of His Majesty's government. And I do not think it is going too far to say that we shall have practically abandoned the position in Egypt which we have acquired after years of patient toil and labour. Our real power and authority were practically gone, and we shall be at the mercy of agitators at any time they care to repeat the methods by which they will say that they have attained their ends in the present crisis. Curzon sent this note to Balfour with a letter in which he told him that his telegram on 2nd of April caused much consternation here. Balfour has, has been seen, spoke there of the importance of not disregarding Allenby's authoritative advice. If it comes to a question of disregarding authoritative advice, rejoined Curzon, let it be borne in mind that Allenby is a soldier of great ability and experience, but no experience of Egypt or its political and administrative problems. Wingate himself, Curzon went on, who had originally suggested allowing an Egyptian delegation to come to London, considered Allenby's policy a disaster. The consequences of this rapid and complete abandonment of our position, Curzon warned, would be catastrophic in Egypt and elsewhere. Curzon, also accompanied by Wingate and Graham, visited Bone the Law, then acting Prime Minister, to try and enlist his support in opposing Allenby. They were not successful. Wingate wrote Bone the Law to Lawyer George, makes a poor impression and I would have no faith whatever in his judgment. On the face of it, I should be inclined to agree with Allenby. Allenby then had his way. He sent another telegram on the 4th of April in that urgent and peremptory tone, which he was to adopt whenever the government showed the slightest hesitation in ratifying his decisions. It was essential, he now told Curzon, that a favourable reply should be given to his proposals, which constituted the least concession that will suffice. Otherwise, the situation would again become bad, as every day's delay augmented his difficulties and increased the gravity of the situation. The CIGS, Sir Henry Wilson, probably investigated by him, added his pressure to Allenby's, in a minute of the latter's telegram on the 4th of April, which he sent to Balfour, though Hardinge, he stated that unless Egypt is kept quiet, we shall be called on for more troops, and we shall have to send them which, under present conditions, are a matter of extreme difficulty. Lloyd George and Balfour gave in. The utmost that Curzon obtained was that they should propose to Allenby that, as an alternative to Zaglul's release, he should announce the setting up of a commission under Milner, which would immediately set about investigating Egyptian grievances but they added they were not in a position to judge whether this was wise, and would leave this matter to your discretion, but in any event, and whatever your decision we shall give you, your offer of support. Allenby promptly replied that though a commission would be desirable later, it was useless now, and that he was announcing forthwith the removal of travel restrictions and the release of the deportees from Malta. In a minute of the 7th of April, Graham wrote that the step taken even before the formation of an Egyptian ministry represented a complete surrender. Why did Allenby act in this precipitate manner? When he reached Egypt, the worst of his disorders was over, and the threat to the British hold over Egypt had been decisively overcome. GHQ's historical summary, mentioned above, states that when Allenby arrived, the Nationalists had begun to despair of success, especially because of the severe attitude of Bolfin, who was in charge of operations, and his refusal to have anything to do with them. Allenby's arrival, therefore, was interpreted as a forerunner of annexation and as indicating an intention to deal firmly with agitators. The release of Zaglul, wrote G.C. Delaney, Reuters um, correspondence in Egypt, in a memorandum sent to Graham, was a concession never anticipated. In fact, the impression I gained was that the leaders were greatly alarmed at the turn of events, had been particularly impressed by General Bolfin's warning that he had intended to take repressive measures which would bring tremendous suffering upon the country, and that at any rate for the moment, 
they were prepared to obliterate Zaglul from their minds and to concentrate their energies on helping to form a ministry, which they declared was the first vital necessity for the restoration of tranquillity. To decree Zaglul's release, Allenby no doubt fought a bold masterstroke, allowing clemency to firmness, as in eliminating what he took to be the main obstacle to an Egyptian settlement. In this he proved utterly wrong. For as Delaney pointed out in the memorandum quoted above, the Egyptians misunderstood the whole situation, translating General Allenby's action in releasing Zaglul into a concession run from the British authorities. It led to truculence never hitherto experienced or even imagined, and Egyptians naturally think that they have only to repeat their tactics to wring still larger concessions. Zaglul and his companions, released from Malta, had gone to Paris where they were bickered and wrote ineffective memoranda to the peace conference and to the powers. Whatever hopes they had had of diplomatic action were soon dashed by the international recognition of the British protectorate. But in Egypt itself, Zaglul absent proved, as a result of Allenby's action, much more effective and powerful than Zaglul present. As Van Sittart put in his minute of the 25th of April 1919, the whole country is going over to him, Zaglul, and the impression that he is on the winning side, and we have conveyed the impression to the Egyptians. The extent of Allenby's miscalculation became speedily apparent, the so-called moderates whom his policy was supposed to attract became very dubious of collaborating with the protecting power since it showed itself so inept, so hesitant and so ready to give in to violence. Though Zaglul's memoranda could make little impression in Paris, yet his denunciations of anybody helping the British had their effect in Egypt. For his supporters grew powerful after his release, donations to the WAFT, whether given into self-protection or whether extracted by threats, became usual. Thus, immediately after Zaglul's release, the well-known notable Badrawi Ashur denoted £10,000, a member of the royal family, Prince Yusuf Kamal, gave 2000 so in that short while, says a chronicler, large amounts of money came to be at the disposal of the waft. Allenby tried to put a stop to what a proclamation of his terms illegal and forced collections, but it was unable to suppress his evil. The British were unsuccessful in putting down another, far more serious evil. This was the WAF's terrorist apparatus, directed by Abdul Rahman Farmi, 1870-1946, who himself acted as the secretary of the WAF's committee in Cairo. Abdul Rahman Farmi, ex-official and uncle of Ali Mahir and Ahmed Mahir, showed great skill in organising demonstrations, riots, intimidation of public men and newspaper editors, in addition to the forced collections which Allenby was unable to prevent. Also under his control was the Supreme Council for Assassinations, composed, among others, of Ahmed Mahir, Mahmud Fahmi al Nukrashi, Abdul Latif al Sufani, and Abdul Rahman al Rafi. Assassinations were, of course, the ultimate and most powerful weapon which the WAF did not scruple to use. Contrary, therefore, to Allenby's expectations, the so called moderates, as much out of the fear as out of political calculation, became more intractable after Zagul's release. Rushdie and Adley did indeed form a ministry, but tranquillity did not, as Allenby had confidently asserted, automatically ensue. The ministry soon had a civil service strike on its hands, in which Ali Mahir took a prominent part. Rushdie and Adley proposed to deal with it by officially announcing that Zaglul and his friend respected the Egyptian nation. Unwilling or afraid to withstand Zaglulist agitation, Rushdie and Adley resigned on the 21st of April 1919, after less than a fortnight in office, the main benefit which Allenby anticipated from his policy was thus speedily shown to be illusory. Mohammed Said was persuaded to form a ministry. He also showed the same unwillingness to shoulder responsibility or adopt a firm policy. His desire to avoid unpopularity among Egyptians and his anxiety to placate his countrymen by measures involving a show of concessions obtained from myself, Allenby wrote in a dispatch of the 10th of July 1919. Having led at times to positions of some difficulty, among the concessions which Mohammed Sayyid succeeded in obtaining were a relaxation in the censorship of the press and of the discontinuance of the military courts for the trial of offences against public security, other than those committed against members of the British army. Both concessions gave greater scope to agitation and subversion, and thus increased unease and disquiet in Egypt. By the end of 1919, and as a consequence of Allenby's policy, Egypt was in a more parlous situation and was more difficult to govern than when he had taken over. But a new element now appeared, which was further to complicate a situation almost hopelessly tangled. As he has been seen, when Allenby at the end of March proposed to release the Glool, he was asked to consider as an alternative policy the dispatch of a mission to investigate Egyptian grievances. He dismissed such an alternative, um, insisting that only his policy would be an answer, but he agreed that it would be useful to send a mission later. It was Lord Milner, the colonial secretary who had served in Egypt under Cromer, who was now appointed to head a special mission to Egypt. Milner, however, was not in favour of going out to Egypt immediately. 
In a most interesting letter which he wrote to Curzon on the 25th of April 1919, he referred to the great blunder made by Allenby when, save himself from being left without an Egyptian ministry, he made the concession about passports and the release of Zaglul and Co. For 30 years we have governed Egypt because of the conviction in the minds of the intriguing Pasha class that in the last resort we could and would do without them. That conviction, for some reason or other, has been weakened of late years, hence the present troubles which are simply a try on on the part of the cast. This being so, Milner concluded it would be a mistake to send a mission just then. It looked as if we were flustered, afraid of the situation created by the non-existence of the, an Egyptian ministry and the naked assertion of British authority, and felt that something must be done to get us out of the hole. Milner was inclined, therefore, to postpone the mission to the following September. Allenby started by depreciating this delay, but the Egyptian Prime Minister, Mohammed Said, wanted the mission postponed until the signature of the peace treaty with Turkey, which would finally consecrate the British position in Egypt. In an urging postponement, Mohammed Said was clearly afraid of the attacks being mounted on him by the WAF to, as a tool of the British, and he did his best by means of public declarations to show himself as opposed to the Milner mission as his Zaglulist opponents. He was no doubt encouraged in this attitude by an attempt on his life organised by the WAF's apparatus. When coming of the Milner mission was finally announced, Mohammed Said found it more advantageous, or perhaps safer, to announce his resignation. He was succeeded by a copt. Yusuf Waba, who was politically of no account, but who, in the circumstances, showed a rare courage in agreeing to take office. Mohammed Sayyid's behaviour once more showed Allenby's impolicy in thinking to attract so-called moderates by making concessions to extremists. Milner, as has been seen, was at the outset for postponing the visit of his mission, but as time went on, he came to see that delay too had its disadvantages. Personally, we find him writing to Graham on the 26th of August 1919, I should not object to postponement, but politically I think it would be a mistake. The mission is based on the assumption that the protectorate exists. Would it, would it not its postponement in itself suggest that we are not sure about it? In this, Milner spoke better than he knew, for he and his mission were to show precisely that fatal uncertainty about the legitimacy of the British position in Egypt, which, added to Allenby's initial blunder, largely ruined the edifice from which Cromer had built with such skill and pertinacity. Today, in any case, had a serious immediate consequence. It gave time to Abdul Rahman Farmi to set foot and perfect a system of threats and agitation, the so-called boycott, which was quite efficient in isolating Milner's mission and in seriously cramping its style. The Milner mission finally arrived in Egypt in December 1919. It left the country the following March. Having heard much evidence from British officials and businessmen from foreign residents and a few Egyptians and having conducted discreet conversations with some leading Egyptians. The purpose of the mission, as defined in a letter from Curzon to Allenby on the 15th of October 1919, was to devise the details of a constitution which would define the respective provinces of British protecting power and of the Egyptian government. Milner himself seems to have set out with the idea that the purpose of the mission was not to liquidate but rather to buttress the protectorate. The way to do this, he came to believe quite clearly, was by negotiating a treaty between Great Britain and Egypt, which would secure to the former the powers of control deemed absolutely necessary. But it was quite emphatic that such a treaty was not a substitute for the protectorate, but only a definition of it, its chief purpose being to save Egyptian face. During his stay in Egypt, however, his ideas seem to have gradually changed. The change which they suffered is most clearly seen in the conversation which he had with a European businessman in Egypt, E.R. Fisher, who took the line that the welfare of Egypt required more, not less, British control. Milner did admit that British control was in the interest of the Egyptian masses, that these masses were mute and the only clamour to be heard was that of politicians abusing and reviling the British. In such circumstances, what Fisher recommended was a fine ideal, but I cannot say that I feel convinced that Great Britain would have the power or will to pursue it. What Fisher said, Milner noted in his diary, rather tended to shake the conviction at which I have been gradually arriving, that the right line for us to take is gradually to draw out of the administration of Egypt and put more real power and responsibility into native hands. As his colleague on the mission, J.A. Spender, later put it, Milner had come to believe that if the Egyptians did not want us to govern them and could keep order and maintain solvency without us, we were under no obligation to undertake the invidious, difficult and very expensive task of governing them against their will. The more Milner got involved in the quicksand of Egyptian negotiations, the more he came to lull himself and with mere words and to believe that in giving up power to the benefit of Zaglul or of Fawad, or one of the so-called moderates, he was actually conferring a benefit on the Egyptians. That this, in fact, was the crown and culmination of Cromer's work, which in days gone by he had celebrated in the well-known work England and Egypt. In 1920, a new edition of this book, the 13th, came to be published. 
for which Milner wrote a new preface. In it, he said that it should be possible to contemplate so large a measure of independence as is now proposed for Egypt is surely the most striking tribute to the efficacy of Great Britain's reforming work. Strangely enough, the view has been expressed in some quarters that any relaxation of British control over the administration of Egypt would be an abandonment of objects which we have hitherto been pursuing in that country. Nothing could be further from the truth. The establishment of Egypt as an independent state in intimate alliance with Great Britain, so far from being a reversal of the policy with which we set out, would be the consummation of it, and that we would should attempt it at all is evidence at once of our good faith and of our confidence in the soundness of the work which we've been doing in Egypt for the last eight and thirty years. And in a debate in the House of Lords, he said on the 4th of November 1920, my belief is that a course of action is possible which will enable us to ensure all that we need in Egypt, including the maintenance of our order and progress, of which we ourselves are the authors, without involving ourselves in permanent hostility with the Egyptian nation. My intimate conviction is that, while there is undoubtedly an element of Egyptian nationalism which is anti-British, the better and stronger elements of it are not anti-British but simply pro-Egyptian. These passages, as the evidence shows, are not merely rhetoric designed for the public defence of a policy, but represent an actual conviction. Their fanciful character and sentimental tone, therefore, indicate a loss of contact with reality. The outcome not so much perhaps of intellectual debility as of that failure of nerve, that weakening of the will to rule, which became manifest among the British ruling classes in the aftermath of the First World War, and which was to make the dissolution of the British Empire so ugly and ruinous to subjects and rulers alike. Commenting in his diary on his conversation with Fisher, Milner recorded that the latter's views were in some respects inconsistent with the conclusions at which, I think, we have most of us arrived. The papers of the Milner mission confirmed this judgment in respect of some at any rate of its members, notably J.A. Spender and Civil Hurst. An undated memorandum by Spender, probably written while the mission was still in Egypt, argued that if the Egyptians were left to themselves, it was extremely probable that the government of Egypt would become an oligarchy in which the poor would be entirely at the mercy of a small governing class. The best hope of correcting these tendencies, Spender went on, is that the political quarrel between Britain and Egypt should be healed and that in giving up formal control, the British should be able to strengthen their influence with the younger Egyptians and to induce them freely to accept their help and guidance. It was, Spender insisted, of the highest importance that concessions should not be made with the arrière pensée that they will fail, but that the utmost help and goodwill should be shown by the British in making them succeed. It is difficult to see how exactly Spender thought that the misgovernment of Egypt could be prevented by a policy of concessions, or who the younger Egyptians were on whom he pinned such faith. But it remains the cause that he believed that the nationalist movement was beyond doubt deep and genuine, and that this fact should govern all future policy. Hearst's views were less high-flown, more down-to-earth. In a memorandum of the 20th of February 1920, he advocated spontaneous concessions because if the legitimate grievances of the Egyptians were met, the cry for complete independence might die away. The argument seems plausible, but is really fallacious, since the legitimate grievances of the Egyptians and the pretensions of Zagul were by no means identical. Hearst had other quite cogent arguments in favour of concessions. Relations with the United States and with the Muslim world might deteriorate if Egypt were held down by force. Again, limited concessions might avert others more far-reaching, which a different British government might feel inclined to concede in the face of a continued disorder in Egypt. The guiding principle of a settlement, according to Hearst, ought to be that Egypt should have control over all sections of the administration which were not vital to British interests and which were not necessary for the discharge of obligations to foreign powers. Egyptian ministers were to be responsible to an Egyptian chamber of deputies, and the sultan was to become a constitutional monarch. The nationalists might reject this as not the complete independence which they were demanding, but experience would show them that their demand was not realistic. Experience, Hearst assessed, is the only argument that will convince the Egyptians that they are not all competent, and I think that experience ought to be forced upon them. British control ought to be withdrawn from ministries which are of no vital interest to Great Britain, whether the Egyptians like it or not. Whether the Egyptians like it or not, the Egyptians must be given to gruel and for what to gulp down like an unpleasant but salutary medicine. But since the exercise of power is quite remote from the practice of medicine, Hearst's liberal, high-minded and confused metaphor had the most sinister of consequences. What this might be can be illustrated from a remark attributed to Hearst and Spender in the papers of the Milner Mission. They had been hearing evidence about the manner in which Zaglulists, by means of pressures and threats, were managing to force Alt Village Omdas to collaborate with them. 
Mrs. Bender and Mr. Hurst, we read in the minutes of evidence, observed that the principle might be adopted of allowing the Egyptian government to do things shocking to us as long as they did not affect foreign interests. If this was what a policy of concessions meant, then it was a policy which sooner rather than later would destroy whatever loyalty and respect the British had managed to inspire in Egypt and make their position meaningless and untenable. This policy, Milner and his mission, and later Allenby and his advisers unhesitatingly recommended. The views of Milner, Spender and Hurst became very much those of the mission as a whole. On their departure from Egypt, they drew up a number of general conclusions, dated 3rd of March 1920, which on the 17th of May, Milner sent Curzon with a covering letter stating that these were the unanimous views of the mission. In these general conclusions, the mission proposed the conclusion of a treaty with Egypt, in determining the measure of control which Great Britain must continue to exercise over Egypt, and for a right to exercise which any treaty must provide. The mission stated, we should be guided by the principle to restrict the direct exercise of British authority to the narrowest possible limits, and outside these limits to rely upon the moral influence of British officials serving under Egyptian ministers in the genuinely Egyptian administration. Couched in the fashionable euphemisms of the time, this proposal embodies essentially Milner's failure of nerve, Spender's liberal fanaticism and Hearst's low and misguided common sense. Side by side with the key passage, we find other statements which seem like meaningless relics from a past age. Asserting British responsibility for the good government of Egypt, the mission recognised that owing to the backwardness of the mass of people, of whom 90% are quite illiterate, it will be many years before any elected assembly is really representative of more than the comparatively limited class. Parliamentary government under the present social conditions, they went on to say, means oligarchical government, and if wholly uncontrolled it would be, likely to show little regard for the interests of the Egyptian people. Therefore, the mission considered that any treaty or convention regulating the relations of Great Britain and Egypt must at the same time define the general character of the future constitution of Egypt. In doing so, they bravely asserted, we must seek to safeguard individual liberty and the interests of the mass of the people. Whether the proposed treaty which restricted British authority to the narrowest possible limit was compatible with such aspirations, whether the moral influence of British officials was alone sufficient to protect individual liberty and the interests of the mass, the mission do not discuss. Even more difficult to reconcile with the mission's main proposal and with what we know of their attitude is the passage in which they discuss what would happen if no treaty were to be concluded. In this event, no relaxation of British control was either possible or desirable. Indeed, they assert, it may be necessary for Great Britain to undertake fresh responsibilities. It is impossible to allow the decline of governmental authority, due to the inherent weakness of the present system, to continue. Um, the evidence, such as it is, shows that there was no disposition at all on the part of Milner and his colleagues to contemplate fresh responsibilities in Egypt. This passage, therefore, figuring in a confidential document, indicates that Milner and his colleagues were either not fully aware of their own assumptions or else that behind the professed unanimity there were unresolved disagreements of which these incompatible proposals are the sign. In their general conclusions, the mission declared that the proposed treaty would have to be confirmed by a representative assembly, but it had first to be negotiated. With whom then to negotiate? The ministry, headed by Yusuf Waba, manifestly had no authority and was moreover itself anxious to avoid involvement in any negotiation whatsoever. In an interview with Milner on the 29th of February 1920, uh, Waba stated that ministers preferred not to be consulted about any proposals which might be made by the Milner mission and begged, moreover, not to be quoted publicly by name. I have always felt, wrote Milner, that ministers were only anxious to see us go away without their having committed themselves in any way. For Wilde, likewise, much as he would have liked to be recognised as the proper authority to negotiate on behalf of Egypt, manifestly could not make good such a claim. There remained the other public men, ex-ministers and notables. They indeed abounded in suggestions and advice and were visibly hungry for power and office. But they were unwilling to shoulder responsibility on their own and terrified of Zaglul and his apparatus in Egypt. The straits to which British were now reduced may be summed up in, in this, that now they had to treat on equal terms with men whom, before 1914, they were un accustomed to manage and with men, moreover, who, unused to rough and tumble real politics, were bound in any negotiation to prove broken reeds. They had to treat with courtiers, with obedient bureaucrats, with tame and safe administrators, who at the slightest squall were likely to scurry for safety. Milner confessed himself disappointed. No one, he wrote to Curzon on the 17th of February 1920, had sufficient courage to break with the extremists that come forward to meet him halfway. 
The exception to all this was the Gluul. His ambition gave him the force of spirit, a frenzy which cowed and intimidated his rivals. The blunders of these rivals and of the British, of course, gave him many opportunities, but it was his character which enabled him to seize these opportunities and shape them to his own purposes. So in the end, the Milner mission had to recognise that if Mohammed would not go to the mountain, the mountain had to come to Mohammed. Those who seemed to have mainly helped it towards this conclusion were Zaglul's rivals, Rushdie and Adli. It was they, as has, would be remembered, who, acting in concert with Zaglul, had precipitated the crisis of November 1919. They now saw a possibility of regaining power with enhanced prestige by getting Milner to agree to autonomy or independence. In a letter of Bent Bender on the 1st of February 1920, Milner said he was quite sure that Adley and his friends were anxious to get rid of the Waba ministry and take their places at once. But as at the end of 1918, Rushdie and Adley now prudently refused to take power or assume responsibility on their own. Adley was in touch with Abdul Rahman Fahmy in Cairo and Zaglul in Paris. He suggested that Zaglul should come back to Cairo and join him in negotiating officially with the Milner mission. But Zaglul, as widely as his correspondent, would not limp limit thus his own freedom of manoeuvre. He declined in February to join the administration to be formed by Adley, lest, as he told Adley, the uprightness of the waft might become suspect, and in order that the confidence which they enjoyed among the people might be of use in providing support and smoothing the path for Adley. Adley and Rushdie now hit on another plan. On the 26th of February, Milner recorded in his diary that Adley had broached the idea of an unofficial delegation approved of but not appointed by the Sultan and the government, which would talk the matter over with the mission. This unofficial delegation was to include Adli, Farwat, Rushdie, Sidki, together with Zaglul and one or two of his friends. The essential, Adli insisted, was that Zaglul should be a party to the move. He, Adli, was willing to go to Paris and induce Zaglul to agree. The advantage of this scheme, according to him, was that negotiations would commit neither government. Milner proved quite favourable to the idea and told Adli that if Zaglul was willing, the mission would raise no difficulty. Now, shortly after the mission's departure from Egypt, Adley himself left for Paris in order to organise the unofficial delegation. From Paris, Adley applied to Milner with hopeful reports. So Glul and his friends, he wrote on the 26th of April, were dans les milieux disposition pour arriver à un accord. Therefore, Milner should send to Paris a person de votre confiance. He would carry out preliminary negotiations. Adley's bulletins were supported and confirmed by those of Walrand. Osmond Walrand had served in South Africa at the turn of the century and had then known and become friendly with Milner. During the war, he was in the Arab Bureau in Cairo and afterwards became an agent of the Secret Intelligence Service in Egypt. Milner listened to and trusted his advice, which, as will be seen, was often erratic and injudicious. When Adley left for Paris, Walrand followed him to provide liaison with Milner. On the 28th of April, he reported to Milner that he had seen Adley, who was surprised to find Zaglul, and his friends in such a conciliatory and chastened frame of mind. Again, on the 8th of May, he wrote that Adley was trying to persuade Zaglul to come to London with one or two other members of the WAFT, and say that it is a private invitation from yourself. Such reports now made Milner, who had been rather sceptical of Adley's chances of success, quite hopeful as to the outcome of negotiations with Zaglul. As far as I can gather, he wrote in the minute of the 8th of May, Adley and Zaglul are working together and may be regarded as the moderate wing of the Nationalist Party. The chances of coming to a good understanding with the Egyptians are far brighter than they were. And the two days later, he went so far as to write to Walrand that in the last report, he was willing to go himself to Paris as he was very anxious to meet Zaglul, but that a meeting in London, if it could be arranged, would be more convenient. But such optimism notwithstanding, it was proving rather difficult to, to entice Zaglul to London. He was now being wooed and was therefore in no hurry to oblige. Also, his basic strategy was to commit himself to nothing and leave himself free to criticise and attack any agreement which Adley or anybody else might negotiate with the British. Before coming to Paris, Walrant had clearly seen this. On the 29th of March, he had written to Milner from Cairo that since the Gaul claimed to have received from the Egyptians a mandate for nothing less than complete independence, he wanted to shift responsibility for any compromise with the British onto Adley and his friends. But now in Paris, in his eagerness to bring Zaglul and Milner together, he seems to have forgotten this. Milner likewise seems to have attached no importance to this situation. His neglect of its implications was shortly to prove quite ruinous to British interests in Egypt. Walrand then enthusiastically believed in Zaglul's readiness to negotiate an agreement, strongly urged that Milner should do this utmost to overcome his hesitations. Milner had proposed that Zaglul and Adley should go to London for private discussions. This would have been consonant with Adley's original suggestion of an unofficial delegation. 
But War Run now points out that Audi and Zaglul not want to do this because their conduct in going to London uninvited and unrecognised would be criticised and turned to their detriment, especially if they came back without results. Audi also did not wish to make a false move and assume responsibility alone. He could not afford to have it said that the WACT had obtained less than they might have because of him. If it was not possible to recognise the WACT, then Zaglul and his colleagues should be invited privately to London, together with Adley. Alternatively, Milner himself might come to Paris or send Sir Reynolds Rod or Mr Hurst. The WACT wrongly called nationalists, asserted war runs, are not unfriendly if we reason with them. It was quite possible, with Adley Pasha's help, to get the WACT on our side. It was quite possible, he continued, compounding his misjudgment, that once the Milner mission and the WACT came together, for the latter to prove reasonable, Warren went on to say that he had shown this letter to Adley, who thoroughly approves of it, and who suggested that Hurst, who was then in Paris, should be taken to see Zuglul privately. He need not discuss the vital points, but talk sweet nothings, and if possible, impress them with his liberal views in general. Milner, therefore, instructed Hurst to get in touch with Adley and Zaglul, who were nervous of coming here on the score of publicity, to try and persuade them of the importance of doing so. When Hurst visited Zaglul, the latter asked whether he was invited to go to London as a representative of the Egyptian people, and whether the invitation would be a written one. Hurst demurred to both of these suggestions. All he was prepared to do was to extend an oral invitation. On ma qualité de membre de la mission Milner, je invite votre excellence à se rendre à Londres pour casser avec le Milner et le membre de la mission et trouver la baisse à la honte. Zaglou then asked whether he was at liberty to write to his followers and tell them that Hurst had visited him and extended such an invitation. Hurst declared that he would have to consult Milner on this point. These proceedings made Walrond impatient, and Hurst, he told Milner, was not supple enough. I have seen nothing in any of the waft, he insisted, to change my views or think them anything but well disposed to us, and all anxious to bring about an accord. They are the Hisp el Uma, the party of the people, and it was an evil day when they were first dubbed nationalists. I do not think that they will, in the end, prove difficile to manage. The WAFT organisation in Egypt, he asserted, if we win them over, contains the intellectual class. We can win them, he assured Milner. I am certain of what I say. But Walrund was not only inclined to show too much of that zile against which Talleyrand had warned diplomats, he was also for a secret agent dangerously gullible. I hope, he went on to tell Milner, you've got Curzon to ask Allenby to go slow for the moment. Of course, the attempts on ministers are not anything to do with the WACT, but only indirectly. I mean, they are not directly responsible and are absolutely ignorant of the organisations for assassination. Having consulted Milner, Hurst told Zaglul that he was at liberty to write and tell his followers of Hurst's visit and invitation, with this proviso that the invitation was to Zaglul in his personal capacity and not as chief of the Egyptian delegation. But these subtle and alembicated distinctions, in the end, availed the British nothing. Zaglul's telegram to Cairo announcing his forthcoming visit to London was for him a distinct triumph. Mission Milner, it said, invita delegation Egyptian per entremis Hurst member de la mission à la surrender à Londres pour discuter avec elle les bestes de haut accord entre Egypte et Grande Bretagne. This is not what Milner had authorised and Hurst had conveyed to Zaglul, but to have publicly contradicted Zaglul at this stage on the point which seemed so unimportant would have jeopardised the talks which Milner, following Adley's and Walbron's assurances, expected to resolve the whole Egyptian difficulty. Zaglul's telegram went on to say that three of his colleagues were travelling ahead of him to London pour assurer de disposition de la Grande Bretagne concernant les aspirations égyptiennes pour l'indépendance complète. This large phrase, Warren informed Milner, means nothing. Milner's conduct of his negotiations with Zaglul was, from first to last, unbusinesslike in the extreme. It does not seem at any stage to have consulted either Curzon or the Cabinet. Equally surprising is Curzon's behaviour in a Cabinet memorandum of the 11th of October 1920. He discloses that the general conclusions of the Milner mission, written in March 1919 and sent to him the following May, were only then being circulated to the Cabinet, he also reveals that it was only at the end of August 1920 that Milner sent him the proposals he had made in negotiations with Zaglul, and by that time the cabinet was already dispersed and unable to discuss them. And it would seem that at no stage from Zaglul's arrival in London, towards the end of May until the end of August, Zaglul informed himself about the character of the progress of the negotiations. 
Milner again showed an anxiety for conciliation, even when prospects of an agreement seemed quite remote, which was so extreme as to be taken for pusillanimity and gullibility. Scott, who was acting High Commissioner in Allaby's absence during the summer of 1920, suggested on the 10th of August that in the event of negotiations with Zaglul, failing, steps should be taken against the Glulis in Egypt. Milner refused to countenance even the discussion of such plans, but he cannot send a telegram on the 14th of August drafted by him, approved of any action which would exacerbate lo- local situation by once more making Zaglul and his followers our enemies. Consolidate all sections of the Egyptian nationalists against us. Of course, we must be prepared sternly to repress disorder, but the idea of breaking up the Zaglulist committees or forbidding the Zaglulists over here to return to Egypt does not commend itself to us at all. No wonder that Scott was shortly to report that the WAFT appeared to continue its somewhat high-handed methods of extracting money from the Fellaheen from a series of petitions and personal visits to the residency. Scott continued, it would appear that its agents, working in some cases it is alleged with the Mammurs, do not hesitate to use threats in the event of the natives being unwilling to contribute. In August, it might be thought there was a real hope of an understanding with Zaglul. By the following November, this hope had utterly disappeared. And yet we find Curzon telegraphing to Allenby at Milner's suggestion, I do not favour the idea of publicly announcing our intention to keep troops in Egypt until we get the terms we want, as this would look like using military pressure to enforce our conditions, whereas it is of the essence of the proposed settlement that it should be a bargain into which the Egyptians entered with their eyes open and of their free will. Miller's attitude to these Zaglouist terrorist apparatus shows even more clearly his misjudgment of the situation and of the men with whom he had to deal. It might be argued that a desire to show goodwill prompted him to instruct Allenby to allow during the negotiations cipher communications between Zaglul and his followers in Egypt, and not to subject to censorship articles in the Egyptian press inspired by the Zaglouists. But his attitude to the arrest, trial and condemnation of Abdel Rahman Fahmy and some of his coadjutors betrays in this experienced statesman a simple-mindedness which is simply astonishing. On the 27th of June 1920, Allenby reported that Abd al Rahman Fahmy was under suspicion of organising terrorism and that he proposed to arrest him and search his house. Approval was given the following day, but on the day after, another telegram was sent ordering Allenby to defer action until further instructions. Approval was at last given, but the requisition of Abd al Rahman Fahmy's house was delayed for a fortnight because it was feared that the search might disclose documents embarrassing to Zaglul. On the 17th of July, Allenby telegraphed once more asking for permission to search, and Jay Tilly at the Foreign Office in the minute of the same date expressed his opposition to such a search, which he feared might end all negotiations with Zaglul. He admitted that failure to perquisition might result in Abdul Rahman Farmi's acquittal, which would make the residents look foolish. But at least negotiations with Zaglul would not be interrupted. Allenby was instructed to defer action, but the following day, the High Commissioner returned to the attack. He sent a very urgent telegram, earnestly begging authority for the search. On the 19th of July, a telegram dictated by Milner expressed doubts whether a perquisition would produce documentary evidence of any value. But at last, gave Allenby a free hand. By then, it was entirely too late and the search produced nothing. Abdul Rahman Fahmy was found guilty and condemned to death in October 1920. So Gould and his friends, then in Paris, protested against the trial and against the prosecutor's allegation that Abdul Rahman Fahmy was the intermediary between Zaglul and the terrorists. Rahman made himself the willing and eager mouthpiece of these protests. In a telegram of the 10th of October from Paris, he expressed the conviction that Zaglul was genuine in the matter. Abdi also thought that something ought to be done, otherwise present atmosphere of fraternity and good feeling in Egypt might be damped. By then, of course, as will be seen, such professions were utterly empty, since Zaglul had done already his best to ensure the failure of the negotiations of Milner. However, in a minute on this telegram, Tilly took the view that a death sentence is pronounced against Abdul Rahman Fahmy and his accomplices were a mistake and should be reduced to imprisonment. The War Office was asked to instruct the Commander-in-Chief Egypt not to confirm the sentences, pending further instructions. Allenby was then in London and he was consulted about a possible commutation of the sentences. In a letter to Tilly of the 13th of October, he rejected Adli's opinion as transmitted by Walrund and insisted that Abdul Rahman Fahmy and the other ringleaders should pay the full penalty. To follow Adli's advice, he said, would be to desert those who stood by us and our friends, and would be surrendered to the party of intimidation and murder. Milner's minute on this letter is curious and instructive. He said that he regarded the business with the greatest misgiving. He had good reason for not feeling sure that the findings of the military court were unimpeachable. If the sentences were to be simply confirmed, I should feel that we were running the risk of something much graver than the bitter failure of the present negotiations, viz a permanent source of bitter and unenveloped feeling.
as bad or worse than the than Shah Wai. We see thus the conservative statesman governed in his actions by the cliches which a decade and more of radical agitation had spread and made familiar. The papers show that Milner and the Foreign Office tried hard to find a way of upsetting the convictions or the sentences. The trial was scrutinised by the judicial advisor to the Egyptian government, who Scott reported in a telegram of the 24th of October, concluded that he could not advise quashing the verdict, since he found that the trial was regularly conducted and the evidence adequate. Hearst at one point tried to find a technical ground for upsetting the trial, but this came to nothing. In the end, however, Abdul Rahman Fahmy's sentence was commuted to 15 years hard labour. When Zaghul came to power in 1924, he was released from prison, but the two quarrelled and fell out the following year. Milner went even further in preventing action against terrorists, and this at a time when all hope of agreement with Zaghul had vanished. On the 21st of October 1920, Scott reported that since the arrest of Abdul Rahman Fahmy, terrorist outrages had ceased. He asked for authority to carry out further investigations which might affect a large number of suspects. The matter was left pending in London for a month and more. On the 25th of November, Milner minuted, My advice would be strongly to drop the pursuit of these real or imaginary criminals. Egypt, he went on, was now tranquil. Why risk a disturbance by such investigations? These might connect some of Zaghul's more extreme followers more or less directly with some of the past outrages. I feel sure, he added, however, that Zaghul himself has nothing to do with them. Allenby was informed on the 27th of November that further investigations of suspected terrorists should be discontinued. In the meantime, Allenby had, as he reported in a telegram of the 25th of November, directed that Fakhri Abd al Nur, suspected leader of seditionists, prime mover of campaign of intimidation and attempted corruption of witnesses for prosecution, should be interrogated by the military authorities. He proposed that other suspects should be similarly dealt with. This proposal, J. Murray of the Egyptian Department, termed unfortunate, and Milner minuted on the 29th of November that so long as Egypt was quiet, it was better to discontinue these investigations. Was so much tenderness towards Zaghul and his apparatus, we may ask, warranted by the negotiations and their outcome, Milner and his colleagues approached these negotiations with the aim of concluding a treaty. The mission, Milner wrote to Adley on the 23rd of June 1920, has publicly declared that its object is to reconcile Egyptian aspirations with the special interests of Great Britain and the legal rights of all foreign residents in the country. I have been and am of opinion that this object might be achieved by the conclusion of a treaty between Great Britain and Egypt. At the very outset then, Milner was abandoning the British position and abandoning it to a set of self-appointed politicians who had no formal authority to negotiate on behalf of Egypt. In effect, Milner was making them a gift of Egypt and its people to milk and misgovern. This was pointed out by the minister Ismail Siri, who happened to be in London at the time of the negotiations. He had an interview with Rod on the 2nd of July 1920, which the latter reported to Milner. Siri pointed out, Rod informed Milner, that we have assumed responsibility, which must not, in common fairness, to the bulk of the Egyptian people surrender. An autonomous Egypt ruled by a parliament, etc., Syria also argued, would deliver Egypt into the hands of the dominant class, who would manipulate elections and purchase votes. The whole system of administration by Bakshish would start afresh, and the fellow would undoubtedly be oppressed. This, of course, is what came to pass, and it did not require great divinatory powers in order to pro- foresee such an outcome. But it may be argued that the mission, having decided that there was no reason why Great Britain should be the party primarily responsible for the internal administration of the country, insomuch as no vital British interest is served thereby, and that such responsibility entails a great burden of the British taxpayer, had discounted serious objections in advance and was willing to tolerate the state of affairs he prognosticated in exchange for a treaty. But did Milner get the treaty he wanted? While he was in Egypt, Milner refused repeatedly and categorically to concede in any conceivable treaty controlled by Egypt of her foreign relations. Our determination to control the foreign affairs of Egypt was, as he told Adley, absolute. He was still of the same opinion at the start of the negotiations with Zaghul, but he found the latter equally adamant that the control of foreign affairs, a question of capital importance, must be conceded to Egypt, or else no agreement was possible. Zaghul made this demand on the 22nd of June. By the 5th of July, Milner had already conceded it. Did this concession ensure a treaty for Milner? It could not possibly do so, since Zaghul and his so-called delegation were really nobody's delegates and had no power to sign the treaty. In justifying its curious proceedings, the Milner mission argued in its report that since a treaty would have been approved by a genuinely representative Egyptian assembly, since a popular elected body became therefore necessary, and since the Zaglulis would command a substantial if not an overwhelming majority in such a body, negotiations with Zaglul became necessary. The argument has the sophistical 
plausibility, which has distinguished recent official British thoughts on imperial matters. But however plausible, it clearly offered no scope for the conclusion of an actual treaty, so that Milner's negotiations, with his resourceful and obstinate opponent, issued not in a treaty but in a document which came to be known as the Milner Zaglu Agreement, but which the Milner Report notes with fine discrimination. On the face of it was not an agreement, but merely an outline of the basis on which an agreement might subsequently be framed. This so-called agreement stipulated that a treaty would be concluded under which Great Britain will recognise the independence of Egypt as a constitutional monarchy with representative institutions. In exchange for this abolition of the protectorate and the virtual abandonment of the British position, the agreement envisaged that Egypt would concede to Great Britain the right to protect the privileges of foreigners and safeguard imperial communications and strategic interests. In conceding so much, Milner no doubt hoped that he would settle the Egyptian problem once and for all, but he seems to have forgotten that the agreement was yet not an agreement and that his opponent was a wily opponent. For having secured all these concessions, the Gaulle now argued that since the agreement did not fulfil all the demands that he had been mandated to pursue, it was necessary for him to go back to his principles, the Egyptian people, and seek their approval. Milner allowed himself to be duped by this gambit, and de Gaulle retired to take the waters in France with Milner's concessions in his pocket and himself uncommitted. He felt he could do better with a little management. He would probably be able to improve his terms and to emerge as the one undisputed leader. He had assured Milner that his agents would recommend the agreement to the Egyptians, and Milner had believed him. But in fact, with them went a secret letter to the Zaglouis in Egypt, explaining that whatever these agents might say in support of Milner's proposals, he himself was against them. He knew, he said, that his colleagues, in a compromising spirit, which he fully understood, which the agreement ratified, for he himself preferred to go with the struggle rather than accept a diminished sovereignty. So Glull's attitude to the agreement did not long remain a secret. A dispatch from Cairo in the Daily Mail on the 7th of September revealed that his objections to the agreement had been published. The agreement, said Glull claimed, did not satisfy the demands of the delegation and they had not accepted it. If now the Egyptian people chose to reject it, Zuglu would also reject it. Tilly minuted it ingeniously. It appears to be extraordinarily bad faith on the part of Zaglul. But Milner chose to shrug off Zaglul's public repudiation of the agreement. I don't think much is to be gained by worrying about Zaglul, he minuted. The control has really passed out of his hands and he will come into line right if enough things go well in Egypt. How could things go well in Egypt in the face of Zaglul's triumphant intransigence? The British authorities seem, at first, to have been deluded by the hope that Zaglul's emissaries would genuinely recommend the agreement and that they're doing so would actually decrease Zaglul's popularity and increase that of Adley's. They also believe that Zaglul might be appealed to show a little courage and back the agreement. Acting on this suggestion, the Foreign Office sent on the 17th of September a telegram, approved by Milner, to Walrund in Paris, in which he was asked to inquire from Adley whether Zaglul could be induced to support the agreement, or whether Adley himself could not intervene and instruct delegates to support proposed agreement and publish his approval of its terms. The telegram exhibits vividly the crass misunderstanding of Egyptian politics, which reigned in the Cairo residency, in the Foreign Office and among the Milner mission. From November 1918, it had been Adley settled resolved to do nothing unless he could carry Zaglul with him, or unless his opposition could be neutralised. By September 1920, this should have been amply apparent, and that it was futile to ask Adley to endorse publicly a set of proposals which Zaglul was publicly attacking. Similarly, Zaglul's attitude towards Adley should by then have been surmised. Zaglul was determined to use Adley, if possible, but not to afford his rival the slightest advantage. His attitude to Adley and Rushdie was as he expressed it in 1921 to Ali Mahir, I will cut their throats before they cut mine. He now let it be known that he, had it not been for Adley, he would have obtained much better terms from Milner. Telegrams which he did nothing to disavow were sent by his followers from Paris to Egypt, claiming that Adley had impeded negotiations and had been a disaster for the WAFT. These tactics led to a schism within the WAFT. Those prominent politicians who had been originally associated with Zaglul now quarrelled with him. The waft became Zaglul's thing, and he was surrounded by hitherto obscure men like Nahas, Makram, Ubayid, Nukrashi, etc., who rose to prominence as he devoted followers and the servants of his cult. Some responsibility for the abysmal misunderstanding of Egyptian affairs must again be laid on the erratic and mercurial Walrond. As has been seen, he had been a most enthusiastic advocate of negotiations between Milner and Zaglul, the previous May. When these difficulties arose a few months later, we find him abruptly altering his tone and pinning all his hopes not on Zaglul but on Adley. 
So Glul Pasha, it is true, we see him writing in the minute of 12th of October, is a desperate and a savage wild man, but he is sincere and has a certain rugged kind of honesty. He is a mere child at negotiations, so Glul, he went on, was intensely vain and ambitious, he was going to be a trouble and Adley alone could control him. Adley could do nothing of the kind, Zaglul and his colleagues returned to London at the end of October 1920 and told Milner that if he wanted an agreement, he had to concede more. In order to make his proposals palatable to the Egyptian people, he was told, Zaglul's emissaries had had to say not that the protectorate would be abolished upon the conclusion of a treaty, but that it had already been abolished and that Egypt would have complete autonomy in internal as in external affairs. Would Milner confirm this interpretation of the agreement? His credulity and patience at last exhausted, Milner refused to do so. His policy was in ruins and the Egyptian problem as far as ever from a solution. Indeed, Milner's mismanagement had prodigiously complicated it and had seriously damaged the British position. The Milner's Zaglul agreement was supposed to be, strictly speaking, not an agreement, but this distinction proved to be purely academic and in actual fact, the British government found itself committed in advance to concessions which should have been the outcome of a hard and fast treaty. Clayton, then an advisor to the interior in Cairo, made the point in a minute of the 20th of September, that is, before the negotiations broke down. If the British government were to refuse to sanction the Milner proposals, he wrote, a serious situation would arise. HMG may not be committed to the scheme technically, but I am convinced that public opinion throughout Egypt and elsewhere in the Near East would regard any drawing back now as a complete breach of faith. With Zaglul and his followers on the rampage, every Egyptian negotiator, whether Adli or anybody else, would be bound to demand more than what Zaglul had rejected, and the vexing thing was that no one in Egypt had seriously expected Milner to offer such concessions. When Fawad was first told of them, he, according to Scott, confessed to a feeling of surprise that there should be a disposition to make concessions of so extensive a nature at the instance of man who had fomented a revolution directed against himself and had caused so much embarrassment to HMG last year. We need not take seriously for Wilde's protestations of injured innocence, which no doubt were meant to hide his jealousy of and dismay at Zaglul's success, but we need not doubt that the surprise was genuine. Again, when the report of the Milner mission was published in the spring of 1921, Allenby reported in a telegram of the 16th of April that the Egyptians were astounded at the extent of the British concessions. The cost of Milner's in policy fell due immediately. Having embarked on an informal negotiations with Zaglul, the British government could not suddenly turn around and refuse further negotiation, and such negotiation had to start for Milner's concessions. Allenby warned in a telegram of the 12th of January 1921 that a wide modification of Milner's proposals would bring extreme party once again into prominence. Three days later, he informed Curzon that the Sultan required a public declaration setting up the official British attitude to the Milner scheme. Two days afterwards, Allenby proposed two alternative lines of policy. The government had either to accept immediately Milner's proposals, or it had to declare that the status of the protectorate was not a satisfactory relation in which Egypt should continue to stand to Great Britain. Now, the treaty would be discussed with an official delegation. Though there was no gain saying the damage to the British position done by Milner's negotiations, yet it could be argued that the best way to limit the damage was by refraining for the moment from negotiations. Abstaining from declarations and putting down the Zaglouist apparatus in Egypt, and in the cabinet which met on the 22nd of February to consider Allenby's suggestions, it was indeed argued that the matter was not urgent and that it had been made perfectly clear that neither government nor parliament were committed to the the scheme. But Curzon was in favour of declaring that the protectorate was not satisfactory and of holding out to the Egyptians the prospect of a treaty. In a cabaret memorandum of the 21st of February, he argued that if the protectorate was abolished, the Egyptians would be pacified by means of a treaty. The British could secure all their interests as we did with the Indian princes a century ago. Milner was also present at the cabinet by invitation, and he urged that the present moment was favourable for a treaty, and that delay might worsen matters. The cabinet, therefore, adopted Curzon's view and authorised the declaration to the effect that a protectorate had ceased to be a satisfactory relation between Great Britain and Egypt, and that another relationship had to be negotiated. By this declaration, the British government officially accepted and ratified Milner's view of the Egyptian problem and unconditionally conceded what Zaglul and his associates had been claiming for more than two years. So anxiety for further talks after Milner's failure was bound to weaken the British position, to admit at the same time that the Zaglouists had been right to denounce the protectorate was gratuitously to weaken his position still further. The declaration of the 22nd of February 1921 made further negotiation necessary, 
with whom then to negotiate? One of Milner's assumptions was that Zaglul and Adli were the only two Egyptian personalities with whom agreement could be reached. Negotiations with Zaglul having broken down, therefore, it was to Adli that Milner looked for success. When the split between Adli and Zaglul became apparent towards the end of 1920, we find him writing, I believe the success of the Entente policy, i.e. between the British and Egypt, depends on Adli's maintaining the lead. His views found an echo in the Foreign Office, where Murray, of the Egyptian Department, declared in the minute of the 20th of November 1920, I should have thought the situation was ripe for a moderate man like Adli Pasha to rally all the more sensible elements to the support of an agreement on the lines of Lord Milner's proposals without reservations. But Adli had been out of power since the spring of 1919, and if he was to negotiate officially, he had to be appointed by the Sultan as Prime Minister, or at least as head of the delegation. Now Fawad did not like Adli and saw no reason why he should get all the credit of having obtained Egyptian independence. Thus when Allenby brought up Adli's name at an interview with Fawad on the 24th of February, the latter replied that he was not of the opinion that he represented any real party in the country and expatiated on the danger of relying too much on him. Parties in the Western sense, the Sultan said, were non-existent in Egypt and Adli could not be regarded as controlling a coherent and important section of public opinion. Fawad's advice was no doubt self-interested, but it happened also to be sound. Fawad tried hard to avoid making Adli Prime Minister, naturally preferring someone who would be clearly his own nominee. The Foreign Office, however, were determined that Adli should become Prime Minister. Adli, Sir Ronald Lindsay thought, quite rightly insisted that Fawad should behave like a constitutional monarch, and jealousy for Egyptian constitutionalism no doubt impelled him to instruct Annabi to enforce this choice. Allenby acted accordingly. On the 14th of March, he sent a message to Fawad advising against the appointment of Mohammed Sayyid, whom Fawad had wanted to make Prime Minister, adding that my advice once given was not my own, but the opinion of His, of his Majesty's government, which they would expect to be followed. In his dispatch recounting this episode, Allenby stated that Fawad accepted Adli with resignation. If Allenby went on, he was unwilling at first to admit the claims of the party to whom the country had come to look for leadership, some allowance must be made for the fact that the blood of Muhammad Ali runs in his veins. It is with difficulty that members of that house can be persuaded that the old order of things had passed away, and that even in Egypt the ruler must conform to democratic practice, and in matters affecting the fate of the country, except the expression of the people's will. It was rather bizarre to mistake the voice of Sir Ronald Graham speaking through the mouth of Lord Curzon for that of the Egyptian people. Adli then was forced on the unwilling Fawad, but it was to any purpose? Did he have it in him to withstand Zaglul, with whom he had broken, and whom now became vociferous in his denunciations? As soon as Adli formed his ministry, Zaglul issued a manifesto from Paris demanding the primacy in any negotiation with the British. Soon thereafter, he returned to Egypt and published his demands in Cairo. He demanded complete control over Adli and his ministry, and declared that the Milner proposals had to be turned down. Martial law abolished, Abdul Rahman finally released from prison, British troops not to be stationed west of the Suez Canal, and the Sudan declared Egyptian territory. These demands, of course, went further than anything Zagul had put before Milner. They were clearly designed to cramp Adli's style and to pave the way for an attack on any conceivable agreement which Adli might reach with the British. Zagul's preface to his demands is revealing. He declared, I have done all the work, I have suffered, I have the confidence of the Egyptian people, I will not see credit for what I have done taken away from me by Adli or anyone else. It is true that Adli has the support of a certain amount of opinion, but his support is mainly semi-foreign. Adli tried to reach an accommodation with Zaglul, but he failed. Zaglul, as Harry Boyle, who was then on a visit to Egypt, reported, looked upon himself as though he was the absolute ruler of the country, and almost seemed to be under the control of some sort of megalomania. To show his power, he began inciting the country against Adli, whom he had denounced as a British agent and a traitor to Egypt. Riots and demonstrations again inflamed the country, one particularly bloody affray took place in Alexandria on the 20th and 21st of May, in which foreigners were murdered and their houses looted. This riot was investigated in some detail by a commission of inquiry, whose report is as classic of its kind. This report makes it possible to form an accurate idea of Zuglu's political methods and organisation. At the outset of the riot, the following circular was distributed among the populace. You have known who are the members of the official delegation, they are the lowest of God's creatures on earth. They are the people who have neither conscience nor honour. They are people who sacrifice their honour for the sake of filling their bellies and fulfilling governmental positions. Where are your students? Where are your fellaheen? Where are your devotees? Where is he who offers to redeem himself, his homeland, and save his country from disaster? Let you be rising. 
rise, you heroes, and generously give what is dear and cheap for the sake of your fatherland, and for the consolidation of the throne of the nation and its faithful agent, Saad Pasha Zaglul. Know ye that heavenly laws and worldly laws allow killing and shedding of blood in this circumstance. Let the Prophet, may Allah bless him, be the best example. He come many in the way of spreading the Mohammedan call and exterminating the influence of Murtadin, and the night resembles the preceding night. We defend the dearest thing on earth, defend our life or death, defend our children and grandchildren. Remember the Prophet's word, the love of home is part of the faith. What have you decided upon? History is on the alert. Long live Saad. No chief except Saad. Down with the government's delegation. Down with the dissentient members. The follower of Muhammad Abdu then, the believer in constitutionalism and reform, did not scruple in his pursuit of power to appeal to the fanaticism of the mob and its savage instincts. Chrome before saw some such development when he said in his report for 1906 that whilst some enlightened Egyptians might wish to divorce politics and religion, yet unless they can convince the Muslim masses of their militant Islamism, they will fail to arrest their attention or attract their sympathy. Appeals, he went on, either overt or covert, to racial and religious passions are thus a necessity of their existence in order to ensure the fervence of their programme. It was a few weeks after the Alexandria riots that Warrond, now back in Egypt as an agent of the Secret Intelligence Service, proposed that Curzon should invite to London an unofficial delegation to be headed by Zaglul. Zaglul, Warrond added, was willing to go, provided the invitation did not come from the Egyptian government. This proposal seems to conclude Warrond's active involvement in Egyptian politics. Adli came to London in the summer of 1921, under the shadow of Zaglul's threats and fulminations. He came pledged, as he stated in a letter to the Sultan, to ensure that the negotiations would issue in Egypt becoming an independent state both from the external and internal point of view. From the start, the prospects of an agreement seemed doubtful. In a telegram of the 7th of May, Allen B. warned that to arrive at an agreement with a delegation led by Adli and to secure its ratification by an Egyptian assembly will be both matters of great difficulty. The Foreign Office had prepared, against Adli's visit, a draft convention which the Cabinet discussed at a meeting on the 11th of July. The draft convention, in its main provisions, terminated the protectorate, allowed the re-establishment of an Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the appointment of Egyptian consuls, but not of diplomatic representatives, gave the British government the right to maintain troops in Egypt and to control the administration of the debt, and established a judicial commission to protect the rights of foreigners in Egypt. Curzon warns the cabinet that the Lord Milner's commission had so far prejudiced the situation that the freedom of the government in negotiations was severely hampered, but he undertook not to make concessions regarding Egyptian diplomatic representation without consulting the cabinet. Negotiation proved very difficult. In reporting the separate points discussed, wrote Lindsay, who took a prominent part in the discussions with Adley, I find difficulty in expressing any opinion with confidence as to what Adley would really accept or definitely reject. He is so often prepared to admit his own personal concurrence with a view without admitting his official acceptance of it that I can do little more than admit impressions. But the fundamental difficulty lay not in Adley's character or his manner of negotiation, it lay in his inability to agree to any treaty which might give. So Glul opening to attack and discredit him. Curzon had, in the end, to concede diplomatic representation, but the talks broke down on the military clause of the draft convention, Adley declaring that it constituted occupation pure and simple. It became clear by mid-November that Adley's failure would mean his resignation. In the final attempt to avert failure, Adley saw Lloyd George. The interview is most interesting in showing the real causes of the breakdown and Adley's limitations in the exercise of power. Limitations which Milner, the Foreign Office, and the residents he had long and adamantly refused to take into consideration. Lloyd George spoke to Adley of the urgency of dealing with Zaglul and his agitations, and threw out the suggestion that he might be deported from Egypt. He proposed that the talk should now be adjourned and resumed after Zaglul's removal. Adley's reaction clearly indicated that he had no stomach for actions of this kind. He was, he told Lindsay, unable to associate himself with any such policy. He had no love for Zaglul and if HMG desired to proceed against him now, it must be their affair, though he himself doubted the advisability of action at this moment. This would merely increase the agitation. As for himself, he could not go back to Egypt, shelter behind Allenby's bayonets, crush the glue, and come back to accept terms which he now rejected. In a final interview with Curzon, again, Adley asked why the British should not themselves put into operation the terms of their own draft convention. The very obvious reason, I replied, wrote Curzon to Allenby, that this could only be done with Egyptian cooperation. And yet he himself, the man most competent to give it, had told me at our previous meeting that his first step on returning to Egypt would be to resign. 
Curzon protested that the Egyptians could not have it both ways, posed as heroes by rejecting the British proposals on one hand, and on the other expect Great Britain by herself to be put into operation, the scheme of very considerable independence which they had chosen to reject. Curzon had, of course, reason to be exasperated, but after all, it was the British themselves who had forced Adley's appointment and chosen to negotiate with him. The failure of the talks with Adley left the British government even more committed to concessions than the breakdown of the Milner Zagul Agreement. In a cabinet committee which considered the British proposals and the Egyptian counter-proposals, Churchill declared that any offer then made, the parts favourable to Egypt, would be remembered and used as a basis of any future discussion, whilst the distasteful parts would be forgotten. Lindsay thought that this could be met by telling Adley that all offers were withdrawn if he rejected the present one. This, however, was easier said than done, and Churchill's fears proved in the end to be justified. Curzon's failure with Adley, as will be seen, transferred the initiative from the Foreign Office to Allenby and his advisers in Cairo. It was they who dictated the settlement embodied in the Declaration of the 28th of February 1922. Their proposals were resisted, albeit ineffectively, by some members of the Cabinet, but the Foreign Office, their views were more often than not echoed and approved by those to whom the Foreign Secretary principally looked for advice on Egyptian matters. Of these, the principal were Lindsay and Murray. In the minute of the October 1920 on the Milner proposals, Murray declared that it was safe to assume that a treaty on the lines of the Milner Zagul Agreement would secure that mutual confidence and collaboration between British and Egyptians, without which an orderly and lasting regime was impossible. It was true that the Milner Zagul Agreement departed widely from the original views of the Milner mission, and that the risks it entailed might be held to be excessive, but it was difficult to discover an alternative course. If the government failed to endorse it, they would be seen as a sign of bad faith and will permanently alienate the sympathies which the result of the negotiations had secured for us. Murray was silent on the character of importance of such sympathies, but he urged that the alternative to Milner's policy was coercion, which meant the maintenance of a costly army and much obliquy for Great Britain in the East. When the negotiations with Adley were nearing breakdown, in a memorandum of the 1st of November, Murray did consider that the possibility of outright annexation should not be set aside and that nothing should be said which might be interpreted as a pledge not to annex. Also, as will be seen, at the very outset of the crisis which Allen B. precipitated following Adley's resignation, Murray, on one solitary occasion, questioned the wisdom of the High Commissioner's policy. But in general, he advocated that the view that the dangers involved in making wider concessions than either Milner or Curzon had contemplated were less formidable than those entailed by a failure to reach agreement. For after all, as he argued in a joint minute with Duff Cooper on the 14th of October 1921, the worst likely consequences of a policy of concessions were the gradual decay and corruption of the administration of Egypt, which would lead to financial difficulty, outbreaks of disorder, massacre of Europeans, whilst the alternative was a prospect of continuous repression depending on the large British army, at least 12,000 strong maintained in Egypt for an indefinite period, and such a policy ran the risk of losing the support of Parliament. Murray and Cooper thought then that the irreducible minimum on which Great Britain had to insist, and which Adley might still reject, was the right to maintain troops in the canal, and for a limited period in Alexandria, the continuation of the status quo in the Sudan, a veto on the appointment of foreigners in the Egyptian service, compensation for British officials whose services were to be terminated, the enactment of an indemnity law to protect British officials against the legal consequences of actions taken during the uprising in 1919, and a guarantee for the payment of loans secured on the Ottoman tribute. Lindsay was exactly of the same mind, commenting in the minute of the 15th of October on Murray's and Cooper's views, he argued that if no agreement with Adley was possible, then the British would have to govern Egypt with bayonets, but the British could not do this well, and for it to have been done at all required the unflinching support of government, parliament and public opinion. This Lindsay did not think forthcoming, and he therefore refused to enter into a path which led to ultimate disaster. The proper objects of British policy in Egypt were the safeguard of imperial interests and of British predominance. This meant that they had to abandon the solicitude we have displayed for 40 years for the orderly conduct of Egyptian domestic affairs, a solicitude, he added, showing how influenced he was by the clichés of the time, which Egyptians had come to resent very strongly. Such a policy, Lindsay thought, places squarely on Egyptian shoulders the exclusive responsibility for the internal administration of Egypt, with all that it implies. It is here that the essential fallacy of this view is most apparent, for in the first place there was no way of separating internal from external affairs, and squarely placing responsibility for the former on the Egyptians, while maintaining British predominance in the respect of the latter, and if per impossible, such a separation could be managed and the Egyptians administered Egypt well, how then would the British justify their military predominance in the country?'
If alternatively, the Egyptians failed in their attempt to administer Egypt, this might require British intervention, as Lindsay recognised, and would not this lead by another road to the ultimate disaster which he was determined to avoid. Lindsay also showed a dangerous ignorance of what political rhetoric can do when he argued in the same minute that if responsibility for the administration of Egypt devolved on the Egyptians, and if they failed in their task, then not even they will be able to blame us for the failure. It is not too much to say that Lindsay was utterly a defeatist in Egyptian affairs. At the start of the negotiations with Adley, the Foreign Office received a paper by Sir William Pater, the legal advisor to the Egyptian Ministry of Finance and to the Residency. In this paper, Pater advocated the immediate granting of complete independence to Egypt, with Britain reserving to herself the protection of foreigners, the safeguard of imperial communications and the defence of Egypt. The arrangement was not to be embodied in a formal treaty, but to constitute an informal modus vivendi for a period of 10 years. In a minute of the 29th of June, Lindsay described this as a valuable and promising suggestion, which might have in the end to be adopted. He recognised that it had weak features, namely that if the British gave way the protectorate, which was their trump card, they would have to face another negotiation ten years hence, with our leverage pro tanto diminished. Also, it would create uncertainty if the modus vivendi was to be for a limited period, and this was undesirable. I admit, wrote Lindsay, this is like borrowing money at rather unserious terms but he was willing to accept this if the crisis could be postponed for 10 years. Hayter's views, as expressed in the memorandum of the 5th of June 1921, which had been cited above, were congruent with the terms of his evidence before the Milner mission in February 1920. He then stated that politically minded Egyptians had a serious grievance. When war broke out in 1914, Egypt was developing towards a large measure of parliamentary government and the Legislative Assembly had made a very promising start. With an optimism which the sequel proved to have been ill-judged and fanciful hater, looked to the Legislative Assembly in an autonomous Egypt to develop a sense of responsibility in Egyptian ministers. These views found an echo among the principal British advisers who had taken office at the interception of the Allenby regime. For shortly after his arrival in Egypt, Allenby had carried out a veritable purge among the senior British officials in the Egyptian government. Dunlop, the educational advisor, and Haynes, the advisor to the interior, resigned. The appointment of Brunyate, the judicial advisor, was terminated. His personality and manner, Allenby informed Curzon, are antipathetic to the Egyptians and cause friction. Allenby's purge was reported to Washington together with a possible explanation for its motive. The advisors of interior and public instructions, wrote the American consul, in addition to several capable subordinates, have been asked to resign. A clean sweep of existing staff appears to be contemplated. There is a strong presumption that this is due to apprehension of foreign office with regard to commission of inquiry held by Milner, which is expected to arrive in October. Insomuch as its members are expected to be of pronounced liberal tendencies, its findings may prove embarrassing to the present regime. Consequently, it may be intended to confront it with a revised administrative personnel and blame for conditions placed on former occupants of various advisory positions. It is more likely that Allenby acted not under the influence of the Foreign Office, but of Sir Gilbert Clayton, who as Chief Political Officer of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, was very close to him, and who became acting advisor to the interior under the new regime. Sir Reginald Patterson, who shortly afterwards became acting financial advisor, now replaced Dunlop at the Ministry of Education. It was thought, writes Humphrey Bowman in his memoirs, that with a new advisor at the helm, sympathetic with Egyptian aspirations and approved ability, discipline would return to the schools. When Patterson retired as financial advisor in 1927, he made a speech in which he requested Egyptians to forget what they consider bad in the old British society, and passed some opinions to the effect that the Egyptians were ripe for self-government and able to conduct the administration of their country. Sheldon Amos replaced Brunier as judicial advisor. Lindsay called him in a minute of a rather mixed radical, and a Belgian lawyer who served in the mixed tribunals described him as a convinced of the value of the principles of British liberalism a prudent application of which he now thought necessary in Egypt. His views on an Egyptian settlement may be gathered from a memorandum of the 27th of July 1921 by Murray. This document gives the gist of a discussion at the Foreign Office in which Lindsay, Murray and Amos considered the likely situation in the event of the talks of Adley breaking down. Adley, it was thought, would then resign, and it was doubtful whether any other Egyptian would have the courage to succeed him. There would then be a risk of a revolutionary movement, which would be preceded by an attempt to paralyse the administration by strikes which, as was discovered in 1919, would be difficult to combat. At this point, Murray added a marginal note to the effect that Mr Amos would like to paint this bogey even blacker than I have done. Terrorism would then break out, which would be impossible to suppress. Therefore, if negotiations with Adley broke down, in order to gain Egyptian sympathies, the British often must look as good as that of Milner. 
the British should insist only on the stationing of forces in Egypt. They should abandon all attempts at financial or judicial control, provided full publicity in the details of financial administration was secured, and provided the appointment was secured of a British official to whom foreigners could appeal against abuses of power by Egyptians. Amos was to play with Clayton, a chief part in the crisis which led to the declaration of the 28th of February 1922. Clayton himself, as has been seen, was in favour of a policy of concessions as early as April 1919. The British, he explained to Gertrude Bell in September 1919, had to maintain control of the Suez Canal, the Nile waters, the army and the police. Otherwise, the Egyptian ministers should be left to carry on as best they could, mistakes they would no doubt make, but they have the right as they came to a fair trial. Such concessions, he thought, would win the majority of the country to the British side. Clayton, we observe, shared with the Milner mission the fallacy that concessions to Zaglul and other members of the official class were demanded by the majority of the country would redound to their benefit and would thus promote among them gratitude to Great Britain. The following decade showed that, as was only natural, British unpopularity in the country at large increased in proportion to the magnitude of British concessions. With the passage of time, Clayton seems to have favoured concessions greater than he was prepared to envisage in 1919. Commentating on Faith Hayter's memorandum of the 5th of June 1921, which has been discussed Above, he asked why it was necessary for the British to station an army in Egypt, for after all, they did not have troops in the Sudan and in Palestine which could be moved to Egypt if the, an international crisis threatened. Again, a small British force in Egypt merely created hostility in the country. Egyptians, moreover, were not so foolish as to attack either the canal or foreigners in the country, why not withdraw British troops entirely and thus both save money and disarm Egyptian hostility? And if such a policy could not be embodied in a treaty then let it be put into force by an unilateral proclamation. The views of the British advisers were widely shared among Allenby's subordinates at the residency. One specimen of their opinions may perhaps suffice. In the letter of the 1st of October 1921 to Sir William Tyrell at the Foreign Office, Walford Selby, then First Secretary at the residency, declared that an agreement with Adley, if it constituted anything less than full satisfaction of Zagul's programme, required to be imposed by the British with just as much force as they would need to impose their own desiderata. Such enforcement was not feasible, and therefore we should take the opportunity proffered by the negotiations with Adli Pasha to get out on the best terms we can. There need to be no fear that foreign troops would replace British in Egypt. British naval predominance in the Mediterranean would prevent France or Italy from intervening on behalf of fat profiteers in Egypt who are no more good to their country of origin than that too of their adoption. Allenby himself seems so genuinely accepted the policies canvassed by his subordinates at the residency, and by the advisers who, it must not be forgotten, had been selected by him. Transmitting Hayter's memorandum on the 5th of June 1921, mentioned above, he informed the Foreign Office that Hayter's views were worthy of serious consideration. They were in general accord with Milner's policy, and I see no reason why the adoption of something on the lines he suggests should not be attended with ultimate success. He also approved Clayton's endorsement of Hayter's proposals. I am, he noted, on Clayton's memorandum of the 8th of October, in general agreement with the views of Sir G. Clayton. In the autumn of 1921, when talks of Adley were still going on, but when hope of agreement was becoming dim, Allenby, who was then in London, attended a meeting of a cabinet subcommittee dealing with the situation in Egypt. He told the ministers that there was a prospect of disorders by the Zaglouists, and Zaglul himself would probably make some movement which would justify his arrest and banishment. If firmness was shown, Allenby declared a moderate government could be formed and could maintain itself. Such had been the case when the rising of 1919 was suppressed, until Lord Milner resuscitated Zaglul, who at that time was moribund. He ended by saying that some form of independence would have to be conceded to Egypt, and the word protectorate abandoned. What is of interest here is not so much Allenby's version of what had followed the 1919 rising, but the clear indication of his ability to form and maintain in power what he called a moderate government. It was equally unambiguous at a cabinet which he was invited to attend on the 4th of November following. Though he personally preferred more liberal terms than were being offered, and up to then we must remember the cabinet had not authorised Curzon to concede diplomatic representation to Egypt, Allenby confirmed that Adley could carry on with the firm support of the British government. He returned to Egypt shortly afterwards. In a telegram of the 12th of November, he reported that both the Sultan and Farwat Pasha were in favour of adopting without delay a firm policy. A few days later, reporting that contrary to his expectations, Adli was likely to resign, he yet told Curzon that Farwat was ready to form a ministry and to fight Zaglul to a finish and was confident of success. 
This telegram Allen be sent on the 18th of November, but on the previous day he had sent another telegram quite at variance in its tone and implications with the language which the High Commissioner had held to ministers in London, as well as with his recent reports from Cairo. This telegram of the 17th of November informed the Foreign Office that the Advisor to the Interior, the Acting Financial Advisor, the Advisor to the Ministry of Education and the Acting Judicial Advisor were unanimously agreed that a decision by the Cabinet which did not admit the principle of Egyptian independence of which maintained the protectorate entailed a serious risk of revolution and the complete administrative chaos rendering government impossible. These officials warned that unless substantial satisfaction were given to the expectations which Egyptians had legitimately formed on the basis of British policy in the last two years, it would be impossible to form a ministry. The advisers, though somewhat alarmist in their language, were no doubt right to speak of expectations having been aroused among Egyptians by successive official British pronouncements. But they also went on to discuss their own state of mind and to hint that unless the British government adopted a particular policy, they would refuse to carry on. They had, the telegram went on, proceeded for the past two years in the belief that a policy of liberal concessions would be adopted and have undoubtedly given this impression to various ministers and others with whom they had been in contact. If a contrary policy was adopted, they felt bound to warn they could not expect to retain the confidence of Egyptian ministers or be able to render useful service in the future. It is legitimate to wonder whether in giving the impression to Egyptians that a policy of liberal concessions would be adopted by the British government, these officials did not exceed their function. For after all, they had no authority to define or expound British policy. The telegram is also surprising on other accounts, as Curzon pointed out in his answer to this telegram on the following day. Allenby knew and could have told the advisers that in the negotiations with Adley, the British government did admit the principle of Egyptian independence and was certainly not trying to maintain the protectorate which months ago it had been declared not to be a satisfactory relationship between Egypt and Great Britain. What then prompted the dispatch of this telegram, a clue might lie in the sibylline hints which the advisers proceeded to throw out. If a liberal programme were approved, it could be, they said, elaborated on the spot and a ministry form to carry it out even if no official convention can be signed by an Egyptian minister, which would admit the programme as full satisfaction of Egyptian claims. The meaning of these riddles was to appear shortly. On the 5th of December, Allenby sent a telegram suggesting that the protectorate should be abolished and that the other British proposals which Adley had rejected should be implemented unilaterally, that is, without the Egyptian quid pro quo, which was of the essence on the whole negotiation. This then is what the advisers meant by their talk of a liberal programme, which could be implemented even if no Egyptian minister would accept it as full satisfaction of the Egyptian claims. What virtue they saw in this arrangement remains obscure. At any rate, Alamy's suggestion was not well received at the Foreign Office. In a minute which totally departed from his usual views, Murray expressed his dislike of the proposal. Lord Annaby's proposal, he wrote, amounts in fact to giving away all that the cabinet were with difficulty introduced to concede in the hope of concluding any agreement with Egypt, and receiving nothing in return except the formation of a government of whose stability and good faith we should have no guarantee. The arrangement would set up a system of political blackmail. Sir Ear Crow agreed with Murray. If such a proposal was agreed to, he minuted on the 6th of December, we should be stultifying ourselves absolutely. Curzon also declared himself opposed to precipitate action, and on the 8th of December, a telegram rejecting his proposal was sent to Allenby. Allenby returned to the charge a few days later. In a telegram of the 11th of December, he again proposed the unilateral abrogation of the protectorate, this time producing new arguments in support. The British government, he now affirmed, could not expect treaty advantages in return for this concession, since the protectorate had taken away something which the Ottomans had conceded, and nothing is more resented in Egypt today then this backward step on behalf of Great Britain. At the Foreign Office, Murray, still constant in opposition, forthrightly minuted, I do not think that HMG should be asked to provide Lord Allenby with a provisional pledge of this kind, which he could then proceed to hawk round amongst the potential Egyptian Prime Ministers. Crow is even more outspoken. It is difficult to believe, he minuted on the 12th of December, that this telegram emanated from the same Lord Allenby who, that when in London, spoke so violently and so consistently against the Milner arrangement and claimed with such confidence that, if supported by HMG, he would have no difficulty in giving effect to the policy of maintaining our position in Egypt. I can only surmise, he went on, that the telegram has been drafted and submitted to him by one of the officials who have always been favoured the undiluted Milner doctrine and who now wants to make it impossible for HMD to follow any other. Mr Murray is right in suggesting that the line now recommended by Lord Annenby is incompatible with the course approved, if not advocated by himself here. Crow then went on to suggest that, 
Allenby should be told that the policy laid down and so clearly explained cannot be suddenly reversed as a result of his own complete vault face, and that he was expected to take the necessary action to carry out this policy. Before an answer in these terms could be sent, two other telegrams, both dated the 12th of December, arrived from Allenby. They made no reference to the, his telegram of the previous day, but reported that Farwat was prepared to form a ministry, that he did not expect an immediate abolition of the protectorate, and that he hoped this to become possible in the near future. What he was proposing was to return to the conditions which had obtained before 1914, and that relations between the Egyptian ministers and the British representatives should be the same as those which existed in the time of Kitchener and his predecessors. Farwat seems to go even further, and to agree that the Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who became, after 1914, a British official, and should continue to be British. Meanwhile, he wished to take note of the undertaking of the British government to terminate the Protectorate. This development seemed to make it no longer necessary to take a decision on Allenby's proposal of the 11th of December, but a telegram of the 15th of December, drafted by Curzon himself, nevertheless insisted on telling the High Commissioner that your suggestion that HMG should pledge themselves to ask Parliament for the abolition of the Protectorate in the hope of obtaining an Egyptian ministry would have been quite unacceptable. Such a course the telegram went on would have been inconsistent with the decision of which HMG arrived at after your consultation with your Lordship and largely upon your advice. To this telegram, Allenby returned no answer. Indeed, for a whole month, he preserved utter silence regarding his proposal of the 11th of December. Farwat, as has been seen, proposed to take note of the British undertaking to abolish the Protectorate, this was an attempt to commit the British government to something which neither Milner nor Curzon had conceded. The British negotiators had been prepared to give up the protectorate in exchange for a treaty. It was out of the question to acquiesce in Farwat's language and give up what had been for two years so strenuously defended. A telegram was therefore sent to Allenby asking him to remind Farwat that His Majesty's government had given no undertaking to terminate the protectorate but had only offered to do so as part of a contract. Following his telegrams of the 12th of December, Allenby remained silent for a week on the progress of his negotiations. When he broke his silence, it was to report on the 20th of December that Farwet had not yet been able to form a ministry, and that he was prohibiting a public meeting called by Zaglul, and that if he made trouble, the High Commissioner proposed to deport him. The following day, Allenby announced that the Zaglulists were fomenting trouble, and that he was prohibiting Zaglul from participating in politics. Two days later, he announced the arrest and impending deportation of Zaglul. In his telegram... Adlenby declared that Adley had expressed satisfaction at the step. No wonder, since the removal of Zaglul by the British conveniently removed his main and most formidable opponent, without him having to incur a bloquee for it. Farwet too, as Adlenby reported in a telegram of the 27th of December, was strongly in favour of Zaglul's deportation, the order for which he was shown in advance. It thus seems fairly clear that Zaglul's deportation to the Seychelles was a stratagem concerted by Allenby with some Egyptian politicians a stratagem which he sprang as much on London as on Zaglul himself, and that Zaglul's mischief-making was merely its convenient pretext. Having concerted with Adley, Farwet and their friends, Zaglul's removal, Allenby now proceeded to concert with the same party, the coercion of the British government. In his telegram on the 27th of December, just mentioned, Allenby stated that Farwet would definitely agree to form a ministry, but that he thought it judicious to allow a month or so to elapse before doing so, in order that the repression of the Zaglulists might produce its full effect. It turned out, however, that Farwat was not as definite in his intentions as he had represented him to be. For on the 12th of January 1922, Allenby abruptly recurred, after his long silence, to his proposal of the 11th of December previous. He admitted that the British government had considered unacceptable the unilateral abrogation of the protectorate, by means of which he had hoped to obtain a ministry. This hope, however, Allenby declared, was now certainty, and he was therefore reverting to his proposal, inconsistent as it was with the decision of His Majesty's government, it was the only course which he saw his way to pursuing. This was no doubt the truth, since by deporting Zaglul and eagerly pressing Farwat's former ministry, Allenby had put himself in the latter's power. He admits as much when he declares in the same telegram that his proposal was the result of exhaustive negotiations with Sarwat Pasha and his immediate adherents. They, on their part, he went on, have been in contact with wider circles and Adli Pasha has been in close touch and lent valuable and disinterested assistance. Allenby's tone in this telegram was extremely pressing. No other policies, he insisted, would serve to pacify Egypt or maintain the friendly disposition of those political elements in Egypt. 
who through times difficult enough for themselves have helped us and dealt straightforwardly with us. The alternative to his proposal was a prospect of alternating outbreaks and repression, ending either in complete capitulation or in the annexation and arbitrary government of a bitterly hostile country. And Allenby ended his telegram by saying that his proposals had the solid and wholehearted support of my advisers without the least divergence, and urgently requesting an early reply by telegram. This telegram took the Foreign Office utterly by surprise. They had received no answer to their telegram on the 15th of December, in which Allenby's proposals had been declared unacceptable. Also for a month and more, they had been led to think that Farwat was ready to form a ministry and resolutely fight Zaglul. They had been given not a hint that his price would be the unilateral abrogation of the Protectorate. In the lengthy and vehement apologia which Allenby prepared when he was summoned to London at the end of January 1922, he does admit that he had been perhaps too sanguine in forecasting when the talks with Adley broke down, so that it would be possible to form a ministry of some sort. In this dispatch, he also tries to justify, thus implicitly admitting the fact his complete silence for a whole month over his negotiations with the Egyptian politicians. During that month, he writes, I have been engaged in preparing from the fluid elements of wavering opinion and fluctuating passion a momentarily stable situation. I confess that the elements were not so manageable as to render it possible for me to present my plan gradually nor, he adds, would an incomplete and tentative plan have merited sufficiently the consideration of his Majesty's government. In this dispatch, he also asserts that it was Zaglul's agitation which, in the end, prevented the formation of a ministry, and that his deportation created a new opportunity in which the use of a new concession would produce not only a ministry, but effects much more far-reaching for the well-being and contentment of Egypt, and for the relief of His Majesty's government from a harassing perplexity. Of this, again, there is no indication in his telegrams at the time. On the contrary, as has been seen, the impression given then was of a move concerted with far away in advance, which was welcomed by him as a prelude to his forming a ministry, Allenby never reporting that this would be at the price of a new concession. Surprising as Allenby's telegram of the 12th of January was, yet both Murray and Lindsay were ready to recommend acceptance of his proposal. In a retreat from his uncharacteristic and momentary firmness, Murray minuted on the 13th of January, Allenby's policy involves a risk. Sarwak might try to rush a decision on reserved subjects and resign if he wishes are not met. But I believe this risk is less great than that involved in a rejection of Lord Allenby's policy. Lindsay likewise had no hesitation in preferring it to the possibility of a governing Egypt without Egyptians and added that the department could only endorse Allenby's warning. It was left for Crow to voice some disquiet over Allenby's policy. I think he wrote in a minute also of the 13th of January. Lord Allenby is to blame for trying to rush HMG in this way. If his policy were followed, we lose all rights and all power, except the actual use of military force. He deplored this and would fain believe that such a surrender ought not to be necessary. But he declared himself not to be in a position to oppose those who speak with intimate knowledge of Egyptian conditions and Egyptian psychosis. It was not only Crow who did not feel knowledgeable enough or competent enough to resist Allenby. The Foreign Secretary himself, who understood the question much more thoroughly than Crow, who had himself drafted the telegram of the 15th of December, telling Allenby that his views were unacceptable, now showed not the slightest wish to oppose the High Commissioner. In fact, he made himself Allenby's advocate in the Cabinet. In a Cabinet memorandum on the 16th of January, he declared that grave consequences would ensue if Allenby's policy were rejected. Furthermore, he argued, the British government were not themselves taking responsibility for this policy, only for recommending it to Parliament, and he went on to praise Allenby for having successfully prevented the Egyptians from attaching, as a condition to their cooperation, the return of Zaglul. There is nothing in the papers to explain Kirsten's vault face. It remains a puzzle, as difficult to account for as other erratic decisions which punctuate the last years in office of this intelligent and sagacious man. When the Cabinet met on the 18th of January, Curzon pressed strongly for the approval of Allenby's policy. He went as far, he told Allenby in a personal telegram, as to back it with a threat of personal resignation. This threat he obviously did not make good. The Cabinet refused to be persuaded, taking the view that if the Protectorate were abolished, there would then exist no sanction to compel Egyptian government to meet us in any particular way except the presence of British forces in the country, which is equally our sole effective guarantee now. They did not think the matter as urgent as Allenby and Curzon represented, and decided to ask the High Commissioner to send Clayton and another official to London for consultations. Allenby rejected this suggestion categorically. The summoning of the officials to London would serve nothing and would undermine his position. 
He declared in a telegram on the 20th of January, if his proposals were rejected, he could rely on the support of no Egyptian. But on the other hand, he affirmed that my proposals, if immediately accepted, would prove basis of a lasting settlement in Egypt. In a separate, most urgent telegram, he informed Curzon that the situation brooked no delay and that if his advice were not accepted, he would resign. The cabinet met on the 23rd of January to consider this threat of resignation. They did not feel disposed to give in to Allenby's threats and Curzon's urgings. They appointed a committee to consider the position created by this threat to resign. It consisted of the Prime Minister, the Lord Privy Seal, Austin Chamberlain, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Robert Horn, and Lord Chancellor, Birkenhead, the Foreign Secretary, Curzon, the Colonial Secretary, Churchill, and the President of the Board of Education, H.A.L. Fisher. This committee considered the draft of a telegram which was sent to Allenby the following day, 24th of January. The telegram began by declaring that the government were most anxious to retain advantages of your services to, in which, to the present critical situation, they attach highest value. But it went on to say that if the Cabinet accepted Allenby's proposal, they might be exposed to the just charge of having abandoned our main position about safeguards for the future. If the Brit- Egyptian ministers, the telegram pointed out, were agreed that Britain should have a special position in Egypt, then they should experience no difficulty in giving the explicit assurances for which the cabinet was asking. To this, Allenby's prompt rejoinder in the telegram of the 25th of January was that if his advice were not taken, all hope of a friendly Egypt in our time would be lost. He was still confident of success, but there should be no further delay. Once more, he offered his resignation and his grounds are significant and revealing. Though I have divulged no secrets, he wrote, my opinions are well known here, and if advice I have offered is rejected, I cannot honourably remain. Allenby is not only saying that his views diverge from those of the government, he is also openly admitting that he had compromised himself by making his own personal policy publicly known and encouraging certain expectations. Such behaviour on the part of Wingate, for instance, would have been censured as indiscreet and improper. In the event, the bull was able to overawe the foreign secretary and the cabinet, and he had his way. To bring them to a proper state of mind, his threat to resign was swiftly followed the next day by a private telegram from Amos to Murray, intimating that the advisers would resign if Allenby's policy were not accepted. At the outset, the cabinet were not disposed to give in to the high commissioner. They held two meetings on the 26th and 27th of January and decided that Allenby should be recalled home to report and that on his arrival, the question of accepting his resignation should be considered. A white paper was even put together and actually set in type to document the government's case against him. A telegram was sent to him on the 28th of January asking him to come home and explain the violent metamorphosis in his views and the ultimatum with which he had seen fit twice to confront His Majesty's government. But this belligerence did not last long. Armed with a long justificatory dispatch and accompanied by Amos and Clayton, Allenby descended on London in the middle of February. His confrontation with the government took place at two crucial meetings on the morning and on the evening of the 15th of February. Present at the meetings were Lawyer George and Curzon, attended by Sir Maurice Hankey and Sir Edward Grigg, and Allenby attended by Clayton and Amos. Allenby proved adamant and obdurant, offering his resignation on both occasions, but in the event Lloyd George shrank from accepting it, probably fearing a debate in Parliament in which Allenby, a peer, would no doubt deliver a damaging attack on the incompetence of the coalition in its handling of Egyptian affairs. Allenby's coup d'etat had succeeded. Towards the end of the evening meeting, when Allenby was threatening yet again to resign, Lord George begged him to be patient and wait for five more minutes. It was in the end agreed that a committee composed of Murray, Grigg and Clayton would meet on the morrow and compose a draft declaration acceptable to Allenby and to the government. The draft declaration conceded all that Allenby had demanded. A face-saving phrase was tacked at the end to the effect that pending the conclusion of agreements relating to the reserved subjects, the status quo in all these matters shall remain intact. At the Cabinet held on the 16th of February to consider the draft, much was made of this sentence. Sir Edward Grigg, the Prime Minister said, had drawn to his attention to the fact that the term status quo was used without further definition and that this would give the High Commissioner the widest possible powers, so much so that he could insist on maintaining every power and privilege which the British then possessed. In fact, Lloyd George assured his colleagues this clause would retain for the British government the powers it had excised under the Granville Declaration together with those superadded by the Declaration of the Protectorate. Needless to say, this clause could never be bear the wide construction which Lloyd George attempted to erect upon it, nor was it ever mentioned or invoked subsequently. Allenby got his declaration. The basis of a lasting settlement it was to be. Sultan Fawad became King Fawad, Farwat became Prime Minister, and Egyptian independence was proclaimed. Zaglul was in exile and his rivals triumphant. They would not remain so for long. 
for he could not be kept indefinitely in exile. And whenever he returned, he could always denounce Allenby's declaration and its reserved subjects as unilateral and therefore not binding on Egypt. And he would be right. In addition, another feature of Allenby's proposal was to consummate Zagul's triumph and eventually lead to the High Commissioner's resignation. When Allenby originally sent his scheme to London, it included a paragraph which said, As regards internal administration of Egypt, His Majesty's Government will view with favour the creation of a parliament with right to control the policy and administration of a constitutional, responsible government. Such a sponsorship of constitutionalism and of parliamentary institutions had formed part of Milner's proposals. When Allenby was told of them in January 1921, he had immediately declared that he did not consider it a British interest to require representative institutions and ministerial responsibility in Egypt. Again, reporting shortly afterwards to Sultan's view that Milner's proposals would merely lead to intrigue, Allenby added, I think that is the view is worthy of consideration. When, therefore, we see Allenby a year later recommending what he had objected to a year earlier, we may say that in this respect, at least his opinions had indeed undergone a violent metamorphosis. Nor is this reason in doubt. He was committed to and, and compromised with Farwat and his friends, who hankered after parliaments and constitutions, either out of conviction or in order to diminish Fouad's power and increase their own. Allenby's proposal did not figure in the declaration of the 28th of February 1922, which contented itself with saying that the future form of government would be left for the people and the Sultan to determine. The declaration was a victory for Farwat and his friends. Much as he disliked them and their constitutional ideas, the Wards had no alternative but to allow them to form a government pledged to constitutionalism and parliamentary government. The Wards tried hard to avoid the constitution, but it could not withstand Allenby, who continued to press for it. And after more than a year's delay, the world at last granted a constitution providing for elections, a parliament and a ministerial responsibility. But it was determined to punish Farwat and his friends who were now organised in the Liberal Constitutionist Party. He chose to do this by allying himself to Zaglul. After his first exile, Zaglul the Girondist, the Jacobin even, was on very bad terms with Fawad. With Farwat in power, however, Zaglul and Fawad became allies. The King's association with the Zaglouis was, Allenby stated in a dispatch of May 1923, deliberate and undisguised. Zaglouis newspapers were receiving large subsidies from the palace, and the King's support was responsible for the recudescence of Zaglouis' strength in the country. Here was a situation similar to that of 1918, when Fawad and Zaglou each hoped to use the other as a cat's paw. Waft and the palace now sang each other's praises. The King even took the Waft's part and in a note to Allenby, who was protesting about the continued assassination of Englishmen, his Prime Minister, Yahya Ibrahim, coolly said that this was the result of not paying heed to the desires of the majority, meaning the waft. Shortly before Zaglul's return to Egypt from his second exile in September 1923, a palace official told an agent of the Secret Intelligence Service that Fawad had fully made up his mind to give his unqualified support for the Zaglouists, he also seems to have sent a message to Zaglul through his man, Hassan Nashat, to the effect that he would be glad if Zaglul would become Prime Minister after the forthcoming elections. In these elections, which took place at the end of 1923, the palace exerted its influence on behalf of the Waft, and Zaglul, the hero of the people who claimed to speak on behalf not of the party but of the whole nation, was returned with a sweeping majority. The world seems to have believed that he could, even so, impose his own nominee as Prime Minister. He was quickly disabused, Zaglul became Prime Minister and inaugurated the three decades of parliamentary misgovernment in Egypt when, as Cromer foretold, under the special title of free institutions, the worst evils of personal government would reappear. As for Allenby, he had not long to wait for what Lord Lloyd had called the dreadful aftermath. At the end of 1924, the Sirdar Lee Stack was murdered in cold blood in the Cairo street, and Allenby, with trumpets and proclamations, had to demolish the base of his lasting settlement. His brusque methods, successful in practice on Lloyd George, did not now please the Foreign Secretary, Sir Austin Chamberlain, who thought they were very like the action of a little boy who puts his thumb to his nose and extends his four fingers in a vulgar expression of defiance and contempt. He sent Neville Henderson to Cairo to expostulate with him, and Allenby, taking offence, resigned in a huff.